£50 million leisure facility there. The Riverside North development would be built on the site of the old town hall. Plans include a nine-storey hotel, cinema and high-class restaurants. But there are fears for the impact it'll have on other local businesses. David Clark from Kempston, who helps run a market stall in the town centre, says there are other concerns as well. Development will bring more confusion. It will deteriorate from the town's well-being. The access that could be made by a Batsford will never be able to take place and the needs which are to be provided are not required. In Luton, residents of Butley Road have been fighting to keep the land behind their homes as open space for over two years now. Well, the council wants to give the land to developers in order to build homes which are in desperate need for the town. Locals had tried to stop the plans by applying for the land to be designated as a village green, but they had been unsuccessful. And finally, after so many years of fighting, it's expected that the council will approve the plan this evening. David Cameron sent out plans to impose tougher curbs on immigrants who want to claim unemployment benefits here in the UK. In a speech later on, he'll say that migrants can no longer expect something for nothing. Those claiming job seekers allowance will have to prove they're actively looking for work and have a good chance of finding a job. The Prime Minister says immigration got out of control under the last government when Britain was seen as a soft touch. Let's turn to sport then. In League One yesterday, Stevenage lost at Tranmere under caretaker manager Mark Roberts. Borough were beaten 3-1 with Luke Freeman scoring their goal. Weather then, a bit of cold out, perhaps a little odd snow flurry later on as well, but set to be a mainly dry day. Temperatures reaching 5 degrees Celsius. That's 41 in Fahrenheit. <coughs> More news. <coughs> you OK there, Ian? Oh, sorry, was my microphone up? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm so sorry, sorry. Please, please finish your, your bulletin. Thank you, sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, there's more news, not coughing, and sport online at bbc.co.uk slash three counties. Sorry, I, I think I hit the button a bit early. Sorry, Serena, I'm, it's a Monday, sorry. I, so I do apologise, listen, the fader was up, I hit the button early before Serena had finished. It's a Monday morning, for goodness sake. So you bang up to speed when you go to work on a Monday? Of course not. Admittedly, for me, it takes till about Tuesday to Wednesday to possibly get up to speed. But, you know, we'll do our best. Morning, this is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. It's cold out there. The um, BBC Three Counties car park is like the proverbial ice rink. I have my new car... I know, I have such bad luck with cars, I know someone's going to skid into it and dent it. I know they are. I know they are. I think I've mentioned this before, about four years ago, three years ago, I had a car, and it was parked up, and uh, I looked out the window one day, and the police were just pulling a van off of my car, where they'd some, someone had smashed into it, completely written it off. Oh, that was annoying. I got a hire car from the company. Literally a week later, parked in the same place, a roof blew off a building and crushed it. I know, a roof blew off the building. I've got pictures on my phone I'll show you later. Not you, them. Uh, so I just know that someone's going to crash into my car. Anyway, irrelevant. Lots coming up on the show this morning, including... Next week, the government is scrapping council tax benefit, depending on where you live. Or we'll hear from one Milton Keynes man who may have to move as a result. And here's a story... Should fat people pay more to fly? One professor thinks people should pay pound for pound. Literally! Lots of ways to get in touch. Facebook.com forward slash BBC 3CR. You can send me a text, 81333. Start your text, 3CR. Or, look, all of the lines are free. Now will be an excellent time to give me a phone call. 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. A Milton Keynes man says he might have to move out of the area if his council tax benefit is lost. Next week, the government is scrapping the subsidy, depending on where you live. It depends how much of the bill you'll have to start paying. This is a real worry to Elliot Lowe, but before we speak to him, let's find out a bit more about the benefit and the changes that are being made. What is council tax benefit? It's money taken off your council tax bill. How much depends on your circumstances like your income. Some people get a reduction, while the poorest people in the country pay no council tax at all. What changes are happening? From the 1st of April, the benefit is being axed. The government is cutting the funding for it by 10% and handing responsibility for it over to 
local councils. Depending on where you live depends on whether you have to start paying a percentage of your council tax. This only applies to people of working age, so pensioners are exempt. What will they now have to pay? It ranges across the three counties. For example, you'll have to pay 33% of your bill in North Hertfordshire, 25% if you're under Decorum Borough Council, but nothing if you live in Watford and St Albans. In central Bedfordshire, it's 25%. In most of Buckinghamshire and Milton Keynes, it's 20%. But if you come under Chiltern District Council, it's nothing. Why are these changes happening? It's part of the biggest overhaul of the benefit system this country has seen since the creation of the welfare state some 60 years ago. The government argues it will simplify the system and make it more profitable for people to work rather than be on benefits. Well, Elliot Lowe from Milton Keynes will have to start paying 20% 20 of his council tax bill from next week. He has a disabled child and is due to lose other benefits. He joins me now. Morning, Elliot. Good morning, how are you? Yeah, fine, thank you. I- explain to me exactly how the council tax benefit works for you and why you've been getting it so far. Um, currently, up until the 1st of April, we've received full benefits, so council tax wasn't an issue for us. Um, and we mainly received that because I'm not able to work because I'm classified as a full-time carer for my disabled son and my wife, who has osteoarthritis and other health problems. Um, now, as of the 1st... Our council tax bill is now, I think it's £216 in a penny. Um, and they break that down, obviously, to 10 monthly instalments, £18 a penny on the 1st of April and £22 thereafter. Right. But it's not just the loss of the council tax benefit that concerns and worries me. It's also, obviously, with this new universal credit and the, the capping system the government are bringing in, I'm also set to lose £150 per week of housing benefit when I only get 176 um, and if that happens, and I've no other opportunity and alternative but to move to a smaller property, and that's affecting my family completely. So you're actually prepared to... You, how long have you been living in Milton Keynes, Elliot? Uh, ten years now. And you're prepared to move out of the area if, if this all goes ahead? Well, it is going ahead, isn't it? I'm not prepared to. I don't think I'm going to have much choice. Right. There's, you know, I don't want to leave because my wife's got her family here and the kids have got to start to grow up. And my, young, my oldest will be nine in June. But I can't really see any other alternative. They, the government have said, well, the Department of Work and Pensions have written to probably virtually everybody who on benefits and said, um, due to the cap coming in, you're set to lose up to X amount from your housing benefit unless you qualify to be exempt from the cap if you're in a certain group of employment support allowance or you have other benefits. Now, when you speak to the Department for Work and Pensions, they say, yes, you're in this group, and because you've got a disabled child, you won't be capped, but speak to your local council. When you speak to your local council, the information they give you is completely different. So it sounds to me, and it seems to me, the Department for Work and Pensions are saying one thing, and the council is saying completely a different thing, and neither of the two know what's actually happening. Is this the thing that we're r- lazily calling the, the bedroom tax? No, that's completely different. Oh, it gets so confusing, Elliot. How do, you keep, how do you keep up to speed with all these different benefits and taxes and caps and things? The internet, for me. Right. We've been on there. We've been, obviously, as soon as we knew the universal credit was coming in, my wife and I have been researching it to see how it would affect us, as a lot of people probably would be doing, to see how they would need to rebudget their finances to try and uh, get by, basically. And uh, it was quite a shock to receive the letter from the Department of Work and Pension saying... Based on the benefits you currently get, you're set to lose £150 per week in housing benefit. And so it, I phoned them straight away and said, is this the case? Or will you need to speak to your local council because they're the ones that are actually introducing the caps and the new, ben- the new change to the benefit system? When you phone them, they haven't got a clue what they're doing either. Mm. Elliot, there are some people listening to this uh, uh, who will be shouting at the radio saying, hang on a second, I pl- pay full council tax. You're only being asked to pay 20% council tax why should you why should you be let off i'm not asking to be let off at all i can completely understand what you're saying all those people be those who are able to go to work now should an employer come to me and say yes elliot would love to give you a job on x amount per year so you can get by and if you need to leave because your disabled son is taken ill we're fine with that but every company i've been to and said you know i'm going to be honest i've got a disabled son there are circumstances where i may need to leave or i won't be in because he's back in hospital they say, unfortunately, we can't do anything for you. It's the flexibility as well of the working mm. environment that I just can't find at the moment. I'd love to go to work. Up until four years ago, I was self-employed. Working, paying my tax, paying my national insurance, paying my council tax, paying my rent, and so forth. But now we're in a situation where I'm a full-time carer. It seems that we're kind of left out in limbo. 
and financially we just can't cope because if, at the moment the carriage allowance is roughly sixty pounds per week. Elliot, listen, I appreciate you coming on at this time in the morning. Thank you very much. It's Elliot Lowe from Milton Keynes. He's going to have to start paying twenty percent council tax from next week. Disabled child. Um, he's a carer, and he's going to lose out on other benefits as well. Well, you can visit your local council website for information on how changes to the benefit system affect you, or you can email your question to us, and we'll put them to our expert, who's going to be joining us on the programme after eight. 3CR at bbc.co.uk. Or you can give me a call, 08459 four double five five double five. BBC Three Counties Radio. So an em- eminent scientist has said, right, fat people, he didn't say it quite like this, he probably said it in a slightly posher way, fat people, you should pay more to travel on the aeroplanes. Well, look, I, I think that makes sense, doesn't it? I think I'm not being, I don't want to be offensive or anything. But if you're a little bit larger, shall we say, then you should pay more. It's the same. I have to pay more if my suitcase is over 23 kilograms. You should pay more, shouldn't you? 08459 455555. 
How could you disagree? It makes perfect sense. Oh, she's back. It's Sophie Tyler. Beds, hearts and bucks travel. BBC Three Counties Radio. Good morning. No major problems to update you with at the moment. Looks like it's all moving fairly nicely out there. Motorways are looking good on the speed sensors. No problems on the M1 or the M25. Looking good down the western stretch at the moment. And the usual delays not yet causing too much of a problem this morning. Looking good on the A405 at the North Orbital Road and on the trains as well. However, we are looking at quite a bit of disruption at the moment, particularly on First Capital Connect. Disruption between Peterborough and King's Cross and Welling Garden City and Moorgate as well, following over running engineering works and a reduced service running on east coast services passing through the area towards king's cross as well following the overrunning engineering works and also causing some problems on first capital connect again between bedford and selhurst as well sophie tyler bbc three counties radio thank you sophie morning it's 6 17 it's monday the 25th of march i'm ian lee and these are your headlines this morning on bbc three counties radio A Milton Keynes man says he might have to move out of the area if he loses his council tax benefit. A final decision will be made tonight on a new £50 million leisure facility for Bedford. In sport, Stevenage lost 3-1 against Tranmere in League One yesterday footballs. The weather today for beds, hearts and bucks, bitterly cold wind, perhaps an odd snow flurry, yet a dry day. Maximum temperature is 5 degrees. Coming up, a new leisure complex in Bedford that will include a hotel and cinema is set to be approved today. We'll find out more before 6.30. BBC Three Counties Radio. Every weekday morning from nine. The JVS Show. With the biggest questions. Today on the big phone-in, I'm asking, would you support some dog breeds being removed from this country? Should traffic wardens be more lenient? Would the government be right to drop the minimum price for alcohol? And the biggest opinions. I think the tax is completely unfair. It doesn't matter how old they are or how young they are. They're still your children. It doesn't matter whether it's male or female or what. I'm disgusted with the people that... You should have cut them people off. The JVS Show. Weekdays from 9 on BBC Three Counties Radio. So, should fat people pay more to travel on aeroplanes? Facebook.com forward slash BBC 3CR. Well, there's an interesting picture that's been um, been posted. We've all had it, haven't we? We're, we're on a plane and the you, you, the seat next to you is empty. Empty. Em- oh, God, I hope they're not going to come and sit. They're sitting next to me. Oh, no. 
Oh, no. And it's a big person. And it's a very big person sat next to you. You're squashed up. Their legs and their arms are all kind of, you know, flopping over onto your seat. And it, well, it's not fair, is it? And if I have to pay extra money because my suitcase may have one or two souvenirs from my trip to the United States, you know, I don't know, maybe some compact discs, uh, video cassettes, things like that, then surely they should pay more because they've stuffed their face full of donuts. 08459 455 555 is the telephone number. Or you can go to facebook.com forward slash BBC 3CR. I'm particularly keen to hear from you if you are of a slightly larger build, perhaps. Do you think this is fair or is it, uh, 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 is it unfair? People having a go at you. People always having a go at you. 08459 455 555. Now, a new leisure complex in Bedford that will include a hotel and cinema is set to be approved today. The Riverside North development will be built on the site of the old town hall. Our reporter, Simon Watts, has been to have a look at how it will impact on the town. It's fair to say the Riverside North project here in Bedford has split opinion. There were nearly 600 objections, while two petitions and submissions of support show that many in the town were also behind the £50 million development. Well, as the name suggests, the nine-storey hotel and cinema complex that will also house retail facilities will be built on the corner of the River Ouse at the site of the old town hall in Bedford. Some felt the designs were out of character and scale of the area. There is already one cinema in Bedford and there's already a hotel across the bridge opposite it. You only have to look across to Milton Keynes at the impact the Snowdome complex with a multi-screen cinema had on the point, which had been the social hub in the area in the 80s and 90s. Others, like this star rowing club here, have concerns over parking. It's right on their doorstep. And outside the Salvation Army Church and Community Centre is a sign celebrating 125 years in Bedford. If the development does go ahead on its doorstep, the car park used by those who visit there and also the market here in the week will disappear. Well, on the flip side, as the high street continues to battle the struggling economy, areas like here in Silver Street in Bedford could thrive with newfound footfall. Although I'm here on a Friday afternoon, you can hear the street band in the background and it's a pretty busy afternoon as well. Lots of people going in and out of the shops. Supporters say new higher class restaurants next to the open frontage of the river will also attract more people. It has been a huge source of debate. It appeals to me big time because I think it only promotes Bedford, it promotes the current businesses and as a new business anything that brings more people into Bedford can only be a benefit. My views are that development will bring more confusion, it will deteriorate from the town's well-being, the access that could be made by Batsford will never be able to take place and the needs which are to be provided are not required. Do you think it will bring more footfall? Footfall in Bedford is the river. It needs to be attractive like the embankment. I don't see concrete tower blocks as being an attractive addition to Bedford. I think it can bring good and bad. There's no harm in bringing extra people and footfall into the town. If it takes too much away from the local companies, then obviously they're going to have an issue. Personally, I think any adventure which is going to bring footfall into the town is a good thing. Well, those views are mixed, and that's pretty much representative of how people seem to feel here in Bedford. Later this evening, planning officers from Bedford Borough Council will meet to make a final decision on whether to approve the Riverside North development. Across beds, hearts and bucks, this is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio. It's Dennis in Dunstable. Good morning. Good morning, Dennis in Dunstable. Good morning, Ian. Good morning, Dennis. Just a minute. She who must be old Bailey's talking in the background. When? Will you shut up? Good morning to me. Oh, Jesus. Right. Right. Are we still there? Only just. Right. Uh, This business of uh, fat people. It's going back in time. In the 20s, when they used to fly from uh, London to Paris in an aircraft called the Hannibal, which wasn't all that big, uh, not only had you got to be weighed, but the seats inside were made of wicker. Not like the heavy things we've got now, but people getting fat. uh, Not only weight, but the cross-sectional area ought to be taken into consideration as well. Because if you've ever sat next to a fat person, if you get a fat person either side of you, you're extremely thin. Yeah. So I think, yes, I think, 
yes, I think there ought to be some adjustment. Now, listen, uh, can I just... I, I want to flag this up. I'm not in any way knocking larger people. To quote Cat Stevens, I like my butts and I cannot lie. But... Uh, I, I just think, in terms of, of flight, uh, th- 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 it should be taken as a consideration. Well, if you sat next to two fat people, one either side of you, on a long flight, yes. uh, God help you. Yeah. Are you are you a large gentleman, Dennis? I'm, uh, shall we say, I'm 15 stone. How tall I'm, are you? Six foot. OK, well, it's, it's still quite a weight. Yeah, but you see, I've got three sons and nearly twice my size, so right. God damn, if they got sat next to me... Yeah, so, but you you might have to pay yeah, a little I pay less, excess. Yeah, I should, should pay less if I have to sit next no, to No, 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 you, you might have to put 15 stone, Dennis. You I might know, have to... I know, it, it's, it's terrible. How would it work? Would, would we have to, like, one by one, like we put our bags on the, the scales yeah. and we look at it, we're keeping our fingers crossed going, oh, I hope it doesn't go over 25 kilograms. Would we all have to, one by one, stand up and be weighed? I should think if you stood... We're putting your bags in. They're standing on a plate there. It would weigh you at the same time. Oh, yeah. You're, ah, that could be a way of doing it. Your combined weight. Yes. So if you've got less luggage, yes. then you can be a little bit heavier in body. Yes, and I think the door, while you stood there, you should be going through a door which is uh, would check your cross, your cross section, if you like. Right. Uh, not about your stomach. So hang on a minute. So if you, can't, if you can't squeeze through a door, then you're not allowed on the plane? No, it's not a matter of that. They charge you more. Right. Oh, you okay. go through one that, that, that does it. It could expand and come back again. Yes. Okay. You know, so you say, oh, yes, fair enough. When was the last time you went on an aeroplane, Dennis? Oh, let me see. Uh, about four years ago. Where did you go? Anywhere exciting? No, we went just down to Southampton. That's all to get on the boat for a cruise. Hang on, sorry. You flew to Southampton? No, sorry. I, I'm getting mixed up here now. We flew Good. to one of the um, places in Spain, uh, Italy. To get <laughs> so what, what's Southampton got to do with it? Sorry, I'm getting mixed up now. Right, getting let's confu- get... In my old age, I'm getting confused. OK, I'm going to ask the question again, and let's forget Spain and Italy and Southampton. Right. right. When was the last time you went on a plane, I'd Dennis? Say about five years ago, when we flew to Italy to catch a boat there to go cruising. And do you, do you go cruising often? Unfortunately, not anymore. Oh. You like cruising? Yes. OK. Well, Dennis, it's lovely to talk to you. Bye. 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 Anyway... Go skiing while the snow's out. Bye. <laughs> There's some uh, random advice there at the end. Thank you, Dennis. It got a bit confu- it got a little bit confusing there. Go skiing while the snow's out. Well, it's, it's something to to bear in mind. Dennis thinks larger people should be charged more. Do you agree? This is the Travel News with Sophie. Beds, hearts and bucks travel. BBC Three Counties Radio. Good morning. We're looking fairly busy at the moment on the A405. That's the North Orbital Road. Particularly heavy approaching the M25 Junction 21A roundabout. Everything else, though, not looking too bad. Motorways are moving nicely at the moment. No problems on the M25 or the M1. Now, on the trains, it is looking fairly busy at the moment. First Capital Connect have disruption between Peterborough and King's Cross and Welling Garden City and Moorgate following the overrunning engineering works at Oakley Park. And a reduced service because of this also running on East Coast on uh, services heading towards King's Cross through the area so do check before you travel and also delays of 25 minutes on First Capital Connect again between Bedford and Selhurst all due to overrunning engineering works at Selhurst itself everything else not too bad at all Sophie Tyler BBC Three Counties Radio Win, will you shut up? Right let's get the latest news and sport now here's Serena Farrow Getting beds hearts and bugs talking This is BBC Three Counties Radio Good morning. A Milton Keynes man says he might have to move out of the area if he loses his council tax benefit. A final decision will be made tonight on a new £50 million leisure facility for Bedford, which includes a nine-storey hotel, cinema and high-class restaurants. Meanwhile, the residents of Butley Road in Luton have been fighting to keep the land behind their homes as open space for over two years now. Well, it's expected that the council will approve the plan this evening. And David Cameron will set out plans to impose tougher curbs on immigrants who want to claim unemployment benefits in the UK. That's the news. Now let's turn to all the morning sport. Beds, hearts and bucks, sport. BBC Three Counties Radio. Starting with cricket and England are heading for a humiliating series defeat after being outplayed on the fourth day of the final test against New Zealand. The home side declared on 241 for six in their second innings. That leaves England to chase a world record target of 481. 
Now, yesterday, League One side Stevenage lost 3-1 against Tranmere at Prenton Park. Managerless Stevenage slipped to their 15th defeat in just 19 games. They're now still remaining 15th in the table. Luke Freeman made it one all with a well-hit free kick for the Borough. Turning to Watford and striker Matej Vidra has run the Championship Player of the Year award. The Hornets' leading goal scorer is on international duty at the moment with the Czech Republic. And Luton Town manager John Still says they still have slim conference playoffs despite not winning at the weekend. The Hatters drew nil-nil at home to Tamworth but still is optimistic. I wouldn't say that it's it's the end, it's just become a touch more difficult um, but not the end, no because football's a funny game, who knows you know out of that nine we might win eight and that might just scare one or two. Rugby now and Saracens move five points clear at the top of the Aviva Premiership with a dominant 27 points to 12 victory over third-placed Harlequins. Schalke Brits and Will Fraser scored tries for Saris and Owen Farrell landed five penalties and a conversion. Saracens director of rugby Mark McCall was pleased with his team's effort. We had some good opportunities, made some great breaks into their 22 and came away with with relative nothing. So the, the try that we scored before half-time and equally the try just after half-time was, uh, was very important. Finally, motor racing and the Formula One world champion Sebastian Vettel won a controversial Malaysian Grand Prix after defying orders to back off and let Red Bull teammate Mark Webber take the chequered flag ahead of him. Vettel, though, later apologised. And Hertfordshire's duo of Lewis Hamilton, Nico Rosberg, finished third and fourth. BBC Three Counties Radio, more from me at seven. Across beds, hearts and bucks, this is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio. I'm reading your comments on Facebook about uh, larger people and should they be forced to pay more um, uh, when they travel on aeroplanes. We have a a filter on the the BBC Facebook page that that filters out bad language, Okay, So even if you think it's a a Category C swear, it probably still won't pop up there. I get to see them. And there's an interesting story about a gentleman who was at a football match, but um, probably best that you don't get to see it. Coming up in the next 30 minutes... David Cameron will announce plans today to restrict access to housing, benefits and NHS care for migrants coming to the UK. A final decision will be made tonight on whether a new £50 million leisure complex in Bedford will be approved. We'll hear from the residents who fear the impact it will have on their lives and should larger people be charged more to fly. Well, one professor thinks they should because their extra weight is using more fuel. 08459 four double five five double five. What do you think? Is it unfair? Are we always targeting the larger people? Or should they pay more?
Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. Who's the gentleman he's talking to there? In the bit in there goes, hey, you, you in the glasses. Who's that guy? We'll, we'll play it again in a month and uh, we'll, we'll listen really closely. David Cameron will announce plans later on today to restrict access to housing, benefits and NHS care for migrants coming to the UK. In a speech this lunchtime, the Prime Minister is expected to say people coming to Britain can't expect something for nothing. The Conservative MP Nadim Zahawi says it's all about making sure the immigration system benefits people who work hard and aspire to get on. We want the right type of people coming to our country, people who will be net contributors to the exchange on day one and if they are going to be here then they ought to contribute to the welfare state before they can become reliant on the welfare state that's what david cameron will be talking about david cameron will say that from next year migrants from the european union will have job seekers benefits cut after six months unless they can prove they've been actively looking for work and stand a genuine chance of finding it this could include speaking good english he wants to make it harder for people to get nhs treatment as well if they're not entitled to it and he'll say councils should bring in a new test for social housing meaning someone would have had to have lived in an area for two or more years before they could go on a waiting list well mike jones is a conservative council leader and speaks for the local government association on housing. He's worried about the idea. If somebody's legitimately allowed in the country, and that's the government's requirement is to set out what the rules are, but if they're in the country legally, then we have a responsibility to do things that are right for people, and that's housing. Now, if we don't house them, that means we're going to have to deal with them under the homeless laws, which costs us a great deal more money. Concerns are also being expressed over the tone of the debate about immigration. The Bishop of Dudley, David Walker, says immigrants are not the problem when it comes to pressures on housing. I've served as a volunteer on housing association boards for at least 25 years now, and the problem is we don't build enough houses, and it's as simple as that. If you're waiting for a property and you've not got one, don't blame immigrants. Blame the fact we've not built enough homes. Earlier this month, the Labour leader, Ed Miliband, apologised for mistakes made by the last Labour government on immigration. And the Prime Minister's speech comes just days after his deputy, Nick Clegg, made a speech abandoning the Liberal Democrat support for an amnesty for illegal immigrants. Lib Dem Treasury Minister Danny Alexander says immigration does benefit Britain, but the system must be seen to be fair. If we're going to continue to be that kind of open, tolerant, welcoming country, then we also have to have an immigration system in which the British public have confidence. Of course, one has to be incredibly careful about the language one uses and about the policies one put forward. But getting that balance right, you know, a strong economy needs to be able to welcome people to do important work Mm. in our country, but a fair society needs to have rules in place that the British public have confidence in. But Labour MP John Mann says David Cameron's speech misses the point. All Cameron's doing is telling councils they've got powers that they already have, given by the last government. But the big issue that underlies this isn't, isn't that, it's jobs. And that's the big problem of the political parties, is people who come in from countries where standards of living are far lower coming in for less money and employers taking them on because they'll work for less. Well, it's clear the main political parties feel they need to talk tough on immigration and are worried about increasing support for the UK Independence Party, which says only leaving the EU would give Britain real control over its borders. Across beds, hearts and bucks, this is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio. You can give us a call about that or any of the other things we're talking about this morning. 08459 four double five five double five. You can text as well, 81333. Start your text, 3CR. One very simple rule, please. Put your phone number, uh, put, put your name on your text. I'd like, like to know who it is we're talking about. One of the other things we're mentioning is uh, larger people. Should they pay more to travel on aeroplanes? Deborah says, on the subject of larger people paying more to get on aeroplanes, I only half agree. I mean, if said person had a glandular problem, which they can't help being overweight, then that could be discriminating against the disabled. But apart from those circumstances, yes, they should pay more. Uh, OK, Do, can you really get fat from glandular things? You hear people saying, oh, it's, uh, yeah, it's glandular. But that can, only, that can only fill you out to a certain extent, can't it? You can't, I don't know. Matt says, should fat people pay more to travel on aeroplanes? In answer, no. A plane is designed to carry a maximum flight weight which far exceeds the weight that can be put in each seat. If you were to charge more, surely you would need to provide larger seats with more room so they can travel with the same comfort that thin passengers. Does it mean an anorexic person should pay less? 
Uh, I saw you on TV this weekend asking how children as young as four were worried about their weight and getting fat, and you asked how could that could happen, and you asked how could that could happen. Well, I should imagine it's all this fat bashing on radio and TV. Matt, you can't blame me for f- four-year-olds being fat. A stupid thing to say. For a ridiculous shifting of blame. Let's all blame it on the media nonsense to say. One thing, I'm not bashing fat people. Secondly, secondly. Uh, you can't blame it on me that four-year-olds are fat. That's entirely the fault of the parents. For goodness sakes, man. I mean, ridiculous. On the subject of immigration, Steve in Luton has called in. Morning, Steve. Hello. Not happy. What, why is this, Stephen? Well, don't want them all here, do we? Only 10% of them are any good. I mean, we've got our own people to look after. I'm self-employed. To take my jobs, we used to have a good standard of living once upon a time, and then Labour... They're a bunch of, anyway, bananas. They let all these immigrants in and diluted my wages. And now we've got, we, we're self-employed people, half of us are probably working part-time at the end of the day. We don't want missing, mass immigration. It's ruined this country. And the, and the BMP and National Front, EDL, have been going on about it for the last 20, 30 years. But nobody listens. And the camera's telling us all about this. He's, he's 30 years behind. Well, you, Steve, you, got, you can't seriously be suggesting that, that the EDL, the BMP and the National Front... Yeah, are... we've been, yeah, well, we've been saying them words and the governments haven't listened. If the government had listened, right, yeah. every government that listened for the last four years, you wouldn't have the BMP, you wouldn't have the National Front, you wouldn't have people in so whatever radical way, far right, whatever you want to dress it up well, as. the National Front but is a racist organisation, Steve. There's no, there's no racist, violent well, organisation. Oh, hold on. If they're not hurting anybody, they're not offending anybody, if they think that way, you have to free democracy of this country to believe in what you want to think. Well, uh, d- aggre- line, aggressive, aggressive racism? It's not aggressive. If someone the wants, National if Front is a racist organisation, Steve. It's based on it's based on race because they want a white Britain. Well, that's up to them. Is it? Is, is that not a free comment? We live in a democracy. You know, I can say what I say. You say what you say. You know, until they cross the line of like smashing windows and beating people up, that's a different ball game. But everyone has the right to a belief for what their opinion is. And if you don't like it, tough, isn't it? Is that not right? Why should you be arrested for your opinions? Uh, anyway, I'm on about no, 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 Steve, Steve, you can't, you can't just throw out a, a, a thing like that. And and then back away from it and carry on I'm with. Not backing, I'm not well, backing then, away. Well, then let me then let me address the issues that you've just raised. Yeah, immigration. We don't want no, it. No, you just, it. no, Stephen, 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 calm down, calm down. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm steaming. I'm well, telling you. Ca- well, I know you're steaming. Calm down. So remove the steam. You've just made a point about the national front. Let me let me a, a, a deal with that before we carry on with your next point. Okay. Go on then. Thank you. The National Front is a horrible, aggressive, right-wing, racist organisation. That should they have their say? Uh, t- do you know what? I-, I-, I don't agree. They should, Steve, because they're well, so. Well, uh, well, uh, well, they're, well, no, no, Stephen, uh, because they're so obnoxious. Now, the BMP and the uh, EDL, uh, you know, I don't agree with them, but yes, I think they should have their say. But I think the National Front is so obnoxious and so nasty that no, it shouldn't. They shouldn't have their say. No. Well, 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 it's, well, you're not, well, you want to go and move the country because that's... The, no, the I don't want to go and move country because I live well, in... you I, don't like it, it's tough, and it? You don't like it, it's fair enough. Well, that's Steve, th- then Steve, if you don't like the fact we've got immigration here... Go and move to another country. It's no, tough. I don't want to. This is my country. Well, this is my country as well. So, I, Stephen, this no, is my country. If you want all the foreigners, Stephen. you'll go and get a pole out, you'll get a Lithuanian to go and do a cheaper job. Yeah. And you'll make this I did. country a I cheap did. country. I got, I got my house. Nature. Stephen, I got my house converted, got a loft conversion. We, yeah. had two, we had two British firms come in and give us a quote. We had a Polish firm come giving us a quote. The Polish firm was tens of thousands of pounds cheaper. They did a fantastic job. They tur- We had some British people come in and do some small jobs on there. The British people turned Turned up at half past ten, left at half past three. The polls were there at half past seven every morning, left at six o'clock in the evening. Yeah, I would go with them every single time, so Steve. You're a, you're a traitor. People like you are traitors to this country. You should be hung for treason because you're against your own people. You're letting other people come in and taking money off our table, food off our table. table. We've had a good standard of Stephen, living Stephen, the last Stephen, years. Stephen, the last Stephen. No, no, no. I'm going to fade you down, Stephen. I'm going to fade you down. I'll tell you why. People can't hear you. Oh, no, you. Stephen, I, people can't hear you. People can't hear you. I'm just going to say this, Stephen. I, I let people come on and say pretty much what they want. Yeah, well, I draw the line. I draw the line at people saying I should be hung. So, Stephen, I'll say bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you for calling. I, I draw the line at people calling for me to be hung. I, I know. I'm old-fashioned like that. Beds, hearts and bucks travel. BBC Three Counties Radio. 
Southbound on the M1 is looking slow at the moment between Junction 12 at Flittick and 11 at Dunstable. And anti-clockwise on the M25, also heavy around Junction 25 at the A10 for Enfield. And slow again between 21 at the M1 and 20 at Kings Langley. No more disruption on First Capital connecting Peterborough and Kings Cross and Welling Garden City in Moorgate following overrunning engineering works at Oakley Park. Also affecting things on East Coast where there is also a reduced service running. So do check before you travel this morning. Sophie Tyler, BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you, Sophie. I I don't mind being called a traitor to my people or I don't, any of those things, Stephen. Mind. I just when people are calling for, for violence or my execution, I, I, I don't know. I just, I get a little uncomfortable at that. That's all. Morning, it's 6.47. It's Monday the 25th of March. I'm Ian Lee. These are your headlines on BBC Three Counties Radio. A Buckinghamshire man fears he'll be kicked out of his home if he loses his council tax benefit. A meeting tonight will decide whether or not to build homes near Butley Road in Luton. And in sport, the Watford striker Matej Vigdra has won the Championship Player of the Year award. Coming up in the show, we're asking, should larger people have to pay more to travel on aeroplanes? 08459 455 555. We'll discuss that after the weather with Sarah Thornton. Beds, hearts and bucks weather. BBC Three Counties Radio. Hello there, very good morning to you. Another bitterly cold start out there. The interesting thing though is you may be looking out your window just thinking, well I don't have to scrape the car, but don't be fooled by that. The air's quite dry, but it is very cold. So we will see temperatures at the moment around uh, the minus one Celsius mark across beds, hearts and bucks. But as we go through the day today, we'll get to a high of just three or four Celsius, well below where we should be for the time of year and certainly tempered by the nagging northeasterly wind. Generally dry through the day, we might see the odd snow flurry coming through, but nothing that will settle. And actually we might see a bit of breaking in the cloud as well later this afternoon. So some bright spells coming through eventually, not that that will help the feel of the weather. Tonight will be again uh, dry and cold with temperatures falling to uh, below freezing in the countryside around zero celsius in the towns and then tomorrow morning again another very cold start once more though the air is quite dry so you won't have to do any scraping on the cars and again a high of around three or four celsius with generally dry weather and that's how we stay for the next few days always a lot of cloud around that nagging northeasterly wind and the temperatures well below par for the time of year and then you'll have heard about it you'll have read about it in the papers there is the risk that we're looking at some snow for Good Friday coming up from the southwest. We will keep you posted on that right here, Ian. Thank you very much indeed. Every weekday from three, Roberto Peroni with the best local news stories. There's a sporting story emerging. Paul Buckle has left Luton Town Football Club by mutual consent. The owners of the Centre MK have withdrawn a part of an application regarding the Primark development. Local talking points. The Hertfordshire Police and Crime Commissioner, Mr David Lloyd, has a plan to get sponsorship for police cars. The best local travel. There's been another day of disruption on the Thameslink line today. We were allowed evacuating from the train and we had to go back to Ratchet and now we're waiting for the bus. Roberto Peroni, every weekday from three on BBC Three Counties Radio.
still recovering from uh, <clears throat> Steve suggesting I'm a traitor to my country and that I should be hung. All I did was get a cheaper quote, get a loft conversion done. You can't hang me for that. <laughs> what a way to start the week. Good morning, Vietnam. Uh, this is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio, 08459 455 555 is the telephone number if you want to give us a call. Facebook.com forward slash BBC 3CR. Now, here's a story that uh, lots of you already have in your say on should fat people pay more to travel. A Norwegian professor wants airlines to charge passengers by the pound, literally. Dr Barrett Batter believes that airlines should charge passengers, <coughs> excuse me, according to how much they weigh. So heavier passengers would pay more for their plane tickets and lighter ones less. Because every extra kilo means using more fuel. Well, our reporter, Justin Dealey, weighing in at 13 and three quarter stone, has been out asking what you think. Justin, this is an interesting... This mm. pops up from time to time. Absolutely. And there are two issues here. We've all been sat on planes and we've got the seat next to us is free and we see a larger person walking down the aisle and we think, please, no, <laughs> please don't sit... Oh, they're sitting next to me. Yeah. So part of it is the comfort issue, because those, yes. those aeroplane seats are too small. Yes, uh, The other true. part of it is that it, the, the more weight that's on an aeroplane, the more fuel that's used. So I guess some people could argue that, that this will be a, a, an environmental green tax. Exactly what this professor is saying. You, you missed that one key word there when you said 13 and three quarter stone. Ripped. OK, next time, put that in the queue sheet. Let, uh, let me yes. just hang on a second. Yes. Let me just add that now. Hang on. Ripped. There you go. OK, done. Thank you, Yes, Justin. so I'm at Luton Airport. You can probably hear the planes behind me. I'm yet to find anybody who is vastly overweight. A good-looking crowd here this morning at Luton Airport. I've been getting the, view the views and the thoughts on uh, what people make of Barrett Barter's comments. And uh, this is what people have had to say. Now, David, straight to the point yourself, you think that passengers should be charged by their weight. Can you tell us why? Because airlines, as a rule, give all passengers a baggage allowance of whatever it may be, 20 kilos or whatever. Now, if each passenger takes 20 kilos baggage allowance, but the, the passenger themselves weighs 15 kilos more than themselves, in effect, they're getting another 15 kilos allowance. I mean, you're slim, so you're OK, but if you were overweight, surely you'd be offended by this, wouldn't you? Probably. Well, here's Catherine. Catherine, I've been nosy. Uh, where are you heading off to today? We're off to Sharm El Sheikh to get some sunshine. Oh, I hate you for that. Um, your comments on people being charged by the pound, what, what do you think? Is that a good move? No, I think it's a bit too emotive. I don't think people would pay the extra charges. I think it's quite offensive as well. Yeah, slightly. Lorraine, you're off to Bulgaria this morning, but what's your thoughts on what this professor's saying? Has he got a point you should be charged by the pound to travel? Yes, I'm sure he has. Yeah, definitely. Can you tell us why? Well, you know, everybody's got an allowance for the luggage, but if somebody weighs, say, 20 kilos more than I do, then they're getting an extra 20 kilos allowance, in effect. Let me just ask you a direct question lastly. How would you feel if you were overweight, though? Uh, probably gutted. <laughs> Gutted. Interesting mm. choice of words. Lots of people commenting about this on the Facebook page, Justin. Uh, Chris says, large people should be charged more. I'm big and have been gymming for seven months, and just the idea of being charged more to fly gives me all the more reason to keep losing weight. Yep. But Amy disagrees, saying, it's a horrible idea. Some people weigh more but aren't overweight. Just because someone is taller, should they be charged more? Men will be charged more than women. The whole idea of being weighed before you board is just horrible. I mean, the, the idea of how you police this, obviously, that, that could get very, very confusing. I came here this morning, didn't really know what to expect. A lot of other people, Ian, have made some pretty outrageous comments about this, but they won't come on the record and right. say this. Most people saying, do you know what, this professor, he has got a point here. Why should I be paying the same price as somebody else who could be 10, 15 stone heavier than me? This should have happened years ago. Those thoughts, unfortunately, couldn't be recorded, but the majority of people here at Luton Airport this morning all saying this is a fantastic idea. Bring it on. Well, Justin, you, you are ripped, and I can't wait to see you at nine o'clock when you come back to BBC Three Counties. But between now and then, what are you up to? Busy morning, in. I'm heading off to uh, Cardinal Newman School in Luton. Traffic could grind to a standstill in the area this morning because up to 300 cars are going to be joining a protest. Now, this is over a proposed loss of free bus travel to the school. It hasn't happened yet, but it could do. So what the parents are doing, they are planning to drive to Cardinal Newman Roman Catholic School. They're going to be dropping 
dropping off their kids this morning, they're going to be picking up their kids this afternoon, and the idea is they're going to be showing Lucenborough Council, look, if you were to scrap the free bus travel, this is what could happen to the town. It could grind to a standstill. So after 7 o'clock this morning, we're going to be live in Lucen, talking to the parents about this protest. Justin, I know you. Please don't get involved. I'm not going to get involved. Please. I'm just going to watch. Don't park, your, talk. don't park your truck in the <laughs> middle of it and stir things up, all right? Just would I, would I do such a thing? Come on. Justin Daly, speak to you later on. He's a very naughty boy. Uh, 08459 455 555 is the phone number. Particularly keen to talk to you as well on the subject of larger people, but also if you're going to be, uh, if you are a parent at the Cardinal Newman Roman Catholic School um, in Luton, are you, are, you, are you part of this protest? Are you d- d- furious that uh, y- this free bus travel is, might be con- uh, cancelled? Are you taking part in this protest? Or do you live near there? The Cardinal Newman Roman Catholic School in Luton. And you're thinking, oh, oh, for goodness sakes, no, not today, please. 08459 555 555. Oh, it's Cecilia by uh, Simon and Garfunkel. We- I- I'd love to hear it. We haven't got time. Instead, we'll go to Sophie Tyler for the travel. and Bucks Travel. BBC Three Counties Radio. Heading south on the Barnet Bypass, looking busy at the moment where you'd expect between Stirling Corner and the Watford Bypass. Now southbound on the M1, also slow between 14 at Milton Keynes and 11 at Dunstable. Also very slow again on the M25 at Anticlockwise, between 26 at Waltham Abbey and 25 at the A10 for Enfield. While also being heavy as well between 21 at the M1 and 20 at Kings Langley. Now on First Capital Connect, we have disruption between Peterborough and Kings Cross and Welling Garden City and Moorgate. It's due to overrunning engineering works at Oakley Park, also causing problems on East Coast, where there is a reduced service running at the moment. Everything else not looking too bad at all. Sophie Tyler, BBC Three Counties Radio. Sophie, thank you very much indeed. Coming up in the next hour of the show, more on larger people on aeroplanes and changes to benef- benefits are happening next week. <clears throat> I'm finding it very emotive. We'll have a look at how you might be affected after the news and sport with Serena Farrow. Getting beds, hearts and bugs talking. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. Good morning. The headlines. Milton Keynes man fears he'll be kicked out of his home. Protest in Luton and Stevenage suffer their 15th defeat in a row. BBC Three Counties Radio. A Milton Keynes man fears he'll be kicked out of his home if he loses his council tax benefit. From next week, the government's scrapping the subsidy. It means Elliot Lowe will now have to pay 20% of his council tax bill. That's something he says he can't afford. If you're in a certain group of employment support allowance or you have other benefits... Now, when you speak to the Department for Working Pensions, they say, yes, you're in this group, and because you've got a disabled child, you won't be capped, but speak to your local council. When you speak to your local council, the information they give you is completely different. So it sounds to me, and it seems to me, the Department for Working Pensions is saying one thing, and the council is saying completely a different thing, and neither of the two know what's actually happening. In other news, planners are meeting this evening to determine whether or not to go ahead with a new leisure complex in the centre of Bedford. The Riverside North project will cost around £50 million and will include a cinema, hotel and shops. There are nearly 600 objections to the facilities, with fears of the impact on parking, the local scenery and other traders. But Gilda Akupens, who opened a restaurant in Bedford Town Centre seven weeks ago, says it may help businesses. It appeals to me big time because I think it only promotes Bedford Bedford, it promotes the current businesses and as a new business anything that brings more people into Bedford can only be a benefit. Meanwhile, residents of Butley Road in Luton have been fighting to keep the land behind their homes as open space for over two years now. The council want to give the land to developers to build homes. Locals, though, applied for the land to be designated as a village green, but were unsuccessful. Well, finally, it's expected the council will approve the plan this evening. David Cameron will set out plans to impose tougher curbs on immigrants who want to claim unemployment benefits in the UK. In a speech later on, he'll say that migrants can no longer expect something for nothing. 
Now, as we've been hearing, traffic may grind to a standstill in parts of Luton today, with up to 300 cars joining a protest. It's over the planned loss of free bus travel to school. Ewan Duncan has the details. The fleet of cars will travel from Stopsley to Cardinal Newman Roman Catholic School. Parents are angry that Luton Borough Council's proposing to scrap the Faith School bus service. They say pupils could be forced to catch two buses if the plans are approved, while some children could be withdrawn from the school if alternative transport proves too expensive. The council says this type of travel is costing the authority more than £1 million a year and it's exploring alternatives. The council executive's scheduled to make a final decision on April the 29th. And stay listening to hear more on this story as Justin Dealey, our roving reporter, will be amongst that protest in the next hour. Sport then now and in League One, Stephen is lost at Tranmere under caretaker manager Mark Roberts yesterday. Borough were beaten 3-1. Weather, and it's bitterly cold out, perhaps the odd snow flurry as well, even more of the stuff. Temperatures 5 degrees Celsius, that's 41 in Fahrenheit. There's more news and sport online at bbc.co.uk slash three counties. BBC Three Counties Radio, first for news. Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. A feisty first hour, including someone, a gentleman, saying I should be hung and that I'm a traitor to my country. Why? Well, you'll have to listen back on the iPlayer. It was a cracking call, about 20 minutes to seven. Well worth a listen. Lots to come up in the next hour, and as always, keen to get your opinions and your thoughts. Where you are in the country could depend on how much council tax benefit you will lose next month. We'll hear from one man who may have to move. The residents of Butley Road in Luton have been fighting to keep the land behind their homes as open space for over two years now. But the process to build new homes could start tonight. And should larger people be charged more to fly? One professor thinks they should because their extra weight is using more fuel. Facebook.com forward slash BBC 3CR. Text 81333, start your text 3CR. Or give me a call 08459 455 555. I'm explaining to the uh, youngsters next door why the first sentence I read there makes no sense whatsoever. Where you are in the country could depend on how much council tax benefit you will lose next month. No, 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 no. It doesn't, it doesn't work. <laughs> It doesn't work. The amount of council tax benefit you could lose next month depends on where you are in the country. That's how it works. That's English. BBC Three Counties Radio. It's, it's, all, it's all a bit of fun. Now, where you are in the country could affect how much council tax benefit you'll lose from next month. That's better. That's what, that works. Thank you. One Milton Keynes man says he will have to move out of the town if his council tax benefit is lost. Elliot Lowe, who was on the show earlier, spoke to me and uh, was telling me how he has a disabled child and is due to lose other benefits come April. You know, I don't want to leave because my wife's got her family here and the kids have started to grow up. And my, younger, my oldest will be nine in June. But I can't really see any other alternative. They, the government have said, well, the Department of Work and Pensions have written to probably virtually everybody who on benefits and said, um, due to the cap coming in, you're set to lose up to X amount from your housing benefit unless you qualify to be exempt from the cap if you're in a certain group of employment support allowance or you have other benefits. Now, when you speak to the Department for Working Pensions, they say, yes, you're in this group, and because you've got a disabled child, you won't be capped, but speak to your local council. When you speak to local council, the information they give you is completely different. So it sounds to me, and it seems to me, the Department for Working Pensions is saying one thing, and the council is saying completely a different thing, and neither of the two know what's actually happening. Gary Volks is the head of the Money Advice Unit at Hertfordshire County Council and can explain more. Morning, Gary. Good morning, Ian. Who is on council tax benefit, and can you explain briefly what it is? Right. Um, council tax benefit obviously helps with your council tax. Um, and it's aimed at people who are in low-paid work, as well as pensioners, people who are unemployed, people who are sick, people who are carers. Um, I, I suspect that your previous caller... Um, there's two issues. One is changes to council tax benefit. One is changes to housing benefit. And I think there are two issues here. Both come into effect from April the 1st. Now, the, the council tax benefit, that means that you could, uh, up until April the 1st, be not have to pay any council tax at all. Is that correct? 
That's right. At the moment, there's a national scheme, and under the national scheme, some people are entitled to 100% rebate. Um, pensioners, people on income support, job seekers, etc. From April, it becomes a local scheme. Each local council has to make its own rules. And some councils are continuing with the national scheme. Some are saying they can't afford that, and they're reducing the maximum benefit. Um, central beds, for example, are requiring, um, I think, a 25% contribution towards your council tax. So why is there this difference between councils then, Gary? Um, it's to do with the funding they receive from central government and what priorities they decide to make at the local level. Um, if, they, if they're continuing to give the full rebate, they're probably having to find the money from somewhere else within the council. So it's a, it's a decision for local councillors to make, and some have made it one way, some have made it the other. But it is having quite an impact. Are you sympathetic with the likes of Elliot, the gentleman we were speaking to earlier on? He's, you know, he seems uh, in, in, in a tough position. He's a full-time carer. He's got a disabled child. His wife's poorly. Uh, and he's going to have to pay 20% council tax. Um, that is a possibility, depending on where he lives, that he could be paying up to 20%, 25% in some areas. It does depend on what the local council have done. Some have said they're giving exemption to certain groups. Uh, pensioners, for example, are guaranteed protection. So if you're a pensioner, you can ignore everything I've been saying for the last five minutes. They're protected. Um, but other groups, carers, people with small children, people with disabilities, may or may not be protected around the council tax issue. The housing benefit one is slightly different. Uh, that's the so-called bedroom tax that you might have been reading about. And I think that's maybe what Elliot has, um, has been getting a mixed message from Department of Work and Pensions and his local council over. But the council tax one, as I say, pensioners are guaranteed protection still. Other groups might get it. Other groups might end up paying 5, 10, 15, 20, even 30% towards their council tax. How is Hertfordshire dealing with it, Gary? Well, we've got ten districts, and I think we've got ten different local schemes, because that's the beauty of what the government calls localism. Um, it is up to local councillors to decide who gets the maximum rebate and what that maximum rebate should be. Uh, I think two of the councils are continuing to give full rebates, and another council um, is requiring, I think, a 35% contribution towards council tax, which, on an average bill of £1,000, is £350 a year or £7 a week. So it's a, it's a very mixed picture. Everywhere you go, Luton, I think, is still giving full rebate. Um, Central Beds is looking for a 25% contribution. It's a very mixed picture because it's a local decision. How much of an impact will this have on, on the poor? Is it affordable to pay council tax while you're on benefits? It's a difficult question. Um, that, you know, when benefits are going up by 1% in April, and this bill for some people, for those who have to pay, will be maybe three, four, five pounds a week out of a weekly benefit of maybe 70, 100 pounds. So it, it's not an enormous sum to, you know, well paid radio presenters like yourself, Ian, or people like myself in local government, but if you're on benefits, you know, an extra three, four, five pounds a week could just be the thing that tips the balance between coping and not coping. Gary, thank you very much indeed. Across beds, hearts and bucks, this is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio. Paul's in Leighton Buzzard. Morning, Paul. Oh, good morning, Ian. How, how's everything going with you, Paul? Good? Well, oh. good. Uh, ah, well, not, it, not bad. There was a tone in your voice, Paul, that implied that maybe everything wasn't as fine and dandy as you were first making oh. us believe. <laughs> no, uh, no, I'm uh, OK. Do you have a look at the front pages with me? Go on, then. OK. I was, uh, that's not what I'd come oh, up what, for. What, what did you come up go for? Go on, I'll go through about no, we'll, the we'll, immigration. Oh, well, do, do you want to give us, give us your little burst on immigration? Uh, well... You don't uh, think not, I should be hung, do you? Not a burst. Hope, hope it's well thought out. Yes. Um, basically, I think the gov- governments, successive governments, have acted far too late on immigrants. Yeah. Uh, I believe that we should have um, strong controls, uh, uh, control over our own borders, um, not be dictated to by Europe. Um, mm. And uh, so... Um, I think that's, uh, you know, I think most, I think the majority of this country um, would agree with that. Well, Paul, listen, you've made your point. Thank you. Should we have a quick look at these front pages now? I'm keen to get your views. The Independent. Oh, did you see this interview um, with Boris Johnson yesterday? 
No. Oh, he was torn to pieces on the BBC. The, the, the front page of The Independent, there's a picture of Boris Johnson slumped in his seat, and the headline is, you're a nasty piece of work, aren't you? Oh, dear. What's that about, then? Well, it's about what I just said. It's about Boris Johnson was interviewed yesterday by Eddie Mayer. Yes. Uh, uh, and at the end of the interview, uh, the interviewer said to, to Boris, you're a nasty piece of work, aren't you? Did he? Yeah. Well, that, that undoubtedly that was must have been on the BBC. It was on the BBC. Yeah. Well, I thought it might be. Ah. Is, now, why do you think that is the BBC sometimes a little bit too harsh in their interviews? I do you think, think the BBC, as as was admitted by your former director general, yes. Um, Which one? There've been so many um, recently. <laughs> yeah, that's the guy that um, flew off to America. Oh yes, to get yes. Out of the Seville. Yes. Uh, thing. Yeah. Anyhow, Seville. Um, I, I, no, I think the BBC is a little bit left wing and uh-huh. uh, is a little bit biased. It's not like the BBC of old, where yeah. they, you know, presented the news as it was, impartial. Uh, but, uh, but yes, uh, yeah. I don't think they're very uh, that. Um, you know, impartiality is one of their strong points now. OK. You, you may have a point. I'm not sure. Uh, the, Daily, <laughs> the Daily Telegraph, pictures of snow. Oh, well, that's nice. Are you enjoying the snow, Paul? Uh, to, a, to a degree. Oh. To a degree. I'm bored of it now. I like the snow, but I'm bored. Uh-huh. I'm bored. <laughs> uh, oh, there's a story for you, the Daily Mail. Migrant, oh, yeah. Migrants told, find work in six months or no benefits. Well, you... I would, I would, I would do, totally agree with that. Yeah. OK. Totally agree with that. And can I just say, Ian, do. as far as your extension was concerned, uh, yes. you, I think you should have had more than one quote from an English company. We had two, we had two English companies' quotes. Yeah. And we I'd had, have... do you know what? And I felt guilty. I got a lot of criticism for getting Polish builders in. So we got an English company to come and do uh, the windows, we got an English company to come and do the floor. They were both awful. Yeah. Their, their attitude, Paul, was terrible. My window was six weeks late. Yes. Six weeks! Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I have to say to a certain extent that the Polish immigrants seem to have simulated themselves into the... Yeah, they're the good uh, ones. It, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I have to say that. Um, they've gone out to, you know, started their own businesses and so on, and, uh, and full marks to them. Finally, Paul, keen to get your, your take on this front page of The Sun. Yes. Flapjack, whack, rap, claptrap. What? <laughs> the the headline on the front page of the Sun is flapjack whack rap clap trap. What's that? School ban on dangerous triangle oat snacks. So they banned flapjacks in a school. Oh. <laughs> Why is that? Because of the obesity. Um, I think it's health and safety. <laughs> <laughs> I think they've been branded dangerous. Oh. Oh crikey. Oh, Might, but... you mind the flap. Do you like flaps? Um. No, 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 not really. I'm not not keen on them. Oh, I, I had some at the weekend. I love them. Oh, yeah, yeah. delicious. <laughs> well, what are they? They oatmeal, oatmeal. Or... Yeah, they are. Oh, are they? Yeah, oh, oatmeal yeah. biscuits. Well, it's health and safety gone mad again. Political correctness. Paul, thank you for that. I could have talked all morning, but we're going to do the travel. Here's Sophie Tyler at seven fifteen. Beds, hearts, and bucks travel. BBC Three Counties Radio. Starting on the motorways, the uh, M1 southbound is still queuing at the moment between 13 at Bedford and 12 at Flittick. Anti-clockwise on the M25, also very slow between 26 at Waltham Abbey and 25 at the A10 for Enfield. And again, fairly heavy between 21 at the M1 and 20 at Kings Langley. Now southbound on the Barnet Bypass, it's queuing at the moment between Stirling Corner and the Watford Bypass. There's more disruption as well on the trains on First Capital Connect, where things are still looking fairly bad at the moment between Peterborough and Kings Cross and Welling Garden City and Moorgate, all due to the over running engineering works at Oakley Park also means there is a reduced service running as well on East Coast services so do check before you travel this morning Sophie Tyler, BBC Three Counties Radio Thank you Sophie Right, 7.16 it's Monday the 25th of March I'm Ian Lee and these are your headlines on BBC Three Counties Radio A Milton Keynes man fears he'll be kicked out of his home if he loses his council tax benefit Planners are meeting tonight to decide whether or not to go ahead with a new leisure complex in Bedford. And in sport, Stevenage slipped to their 15th, 15th defeat in 19 games with a loss against Tranmere yesterday. The weather today for beds, hearts and bucks, bitterly cold wind, perhaps an odd snow flurry, yet a dry day. Maximum temperature is 5 degrees. Coming up, planners will make a final decision tonight on whether to approve a new £50 million leisure complex on the Bedford Riverside. But do you want it? 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. 
Tackling your consumer problems. On BBC Three Counties Radio. My son took it to, back to the, the garage. The mechanic says, yeah, I know what it is. So they took it in, done what they had to do, and the car was still the same, still doing the same thing. The JVS Show. Fighting for your rights. The long and short of it is, he agreed that he would replace the car. If you have a consumer problem, we can do the same for you. I'd like to thank you and your team for everything you've done. We wouldn't have got where we got without you. It's a pleasure. I'm going to call that a result. Any other problems, you know where I am, Stuart. The JVS Show. Fighting for your rights. Weekday mornings from nine on BBC Three Counties Radio. He is good. If you've got a, a consumer problem uh, or you just want to get in touch with JVS, maybe you want to um, just say hello or send him pictures of you in bed. I don't know. Some people do like to do that. You can send him an email. JVS Show at bbc.co.uk. I'd, I'd, I'd primarily use it for consumer things and stories he might be interested in, not the nudie photographs. I think that might make him very upset. Now, planners will make a final decision tonight on whether to approve a new £50 million leisure complex in Bedford. A cinema, hotel, high-class restaurants and retail space will be provided on the site of the old town hall. But many people living in Bedford fear the impact the Riverside North development will have on parking, local shops and the local scenery. Our reporter Simon Watts has been speaking to people working in Bedford Town Centre. So you've only recently opened up a new restaurant here in the centre of Bedford. Does the idea of the cinema complex, hotel and also new restaurants appeal to you or not it appeals to me big time because i think it only promotes bedford it promotes the current businesses and as a new business anything that brings more people into bedford can only be a benefit do you think bedford needs something like this to attract new people here Definitely. Um, Obviously, you can walk around Bedford, you see a lot of places that are empty. So I think once, you know, more people come, more businesses will hopefully invest in the community in the area. So I think it's a plus. One of the comments that has been made in favour, supporters saying new higher class restaurants next to the riverfront will attract more people. Would that be direct competition or are you comfortable with your marketplace? Um, I'm very comfortable because we're quite niche. We're vegetarian and we cater for for vegans and gluten-free and alternative diets. It doesn't matter whether you're in competition or not. Everyone's got their kind of own niche areas to promote. So the more, the better, and it's better for Bedford and the community. Well, you work here in the town centre. Do you think that the development, if it goes ahead, will be a good thing for the town or not? My views are that development will bring more confusion it will deteriorate from the town's well-being the access that could be made by a bats ford will never be able to take place and the needs which are to be provided are not required do you think it will bring more footfall that's one of the key arguments for it footfall in bedford is the river it needs to be attractive like the embankment I don't see concrete tower blocks as being an attractive addition to Bedford. So you feel that the architecture isn't massively appealing then? The architecture is not in keeping with the riverside of Bedford and taking in consideration the ancient courthouse, it's not in keeping with that frontage that is there existingly. So you run a fast food outlet here in the town centre. How long have you been here for? Approximately 20 years. So would you say the introduction of a new complex here with a cinema, with a hotel and and other restaurants as well will be a good or bad thing for the town? I think it can bring good and bad. There's no harm in bringing extra people and footfall into the town. If it takes too much away from the local companies, then obviously they're going to have an issue. Personally, I think any adventure which is going to bring footfall into the town is a good thing. Yeah, do you think it could do with that little boost to get more people here? Definitely. You hear many people complain there's nothing in Bedford to attract. So if it is a a good thing to bring them in, then why not? Well, joined now by Rod Calvert, who's from the Bedford Chamber of Commerce. Morning, Rod. Good morning. Come to you in a second. First of all, I want to say hello to John Lloyd, who's one of the residents who is concerned at the development. John, what are your fears? Oh, good morning, Ian. Um, We are in favour of the development of a development, but not this development. Why? Um, Bedford has historic character. It has a beautiful, beautiful river landscape, which is unique. It needs to be preserved and enhanced. There is a town centre action plan that lays down how that should be done, how this development should be done, and it says things like uh, we should differentiate ourselves from Milton Keynes. Bedford has been around for 800 years before Milton Keynes ever existed, and the character of the town is enormous. We have this unique river, uh, and 
we need to be attractive and have high quality design to promote tourism and visitors. And you don't now, think this des- this design is a- a- attractive or high quality? No, it's certainly not. I mean, it's unbelievably ugly. Well, let's put that to, to Rod Calvert. Rod, it's ugly and it doesn't suit the character of Bedford. A very interesting point, and uh, I think you get as many uh, opinions on the quality of the design and its appearance as there are people to ask. Uh, our argument is strongly in favour of the economic side of the equation. Um, having been in business and around business for uh, more years than I care to admit to, uh, it's very interesting to note that Bedford is just moribund. We've just sat there, we've deferred opinions, we've deferred plans for, for years and years and years and years. And uh, we do have this wonderful uh, riverside and embankment, I agree. The area that we're talking about developing is not wonderful, it's pretty awful as it is at the moment. Uh, we're going to get rid of the, uh, the 60s uh, town hall. We're going to actually open the town centre up, if this goes ahead, right into the river. The river and the town centre will be drawn together. Uh, I can imagine the, uh, the boats moored on the, on the riverfront and suddenly become alive and, 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 and booming. And all the studies indicate that uh, we'll get a really increased uh, footfall. This will spin on to just about everything in the town centre. There are some issues with regard to peripheral businesses, we agree. But uh, we see it all as, uh, as an extremely positive uh, move. And frankly, although we've got much of the old Bedfordshire architecture, um, I think contemporary and, and, and old have to get together. The sort of transition between a, a microbrewery on the edge of the courts into the, into the newer uh, open public spaces and so on, I think is, uh, is quite exciting. Uh, John, it, it, it sounds like it's going to be great for Bedford. It's going to reinvigorate business. Let me read you out the comments that the public made at the September consultation about the appearance of these buildings. Right? I'll just go through them. Well, these brief are on if you the public would. record. Ugly. Too blocky. Terrible. Too close to the river. Square boxes. Overbearing. Unimaginative. Industrial style. It's a carbuncle. Eyesore. Disappointing design. Cheese grater. Rag bag of buildings. Cheese grater. Poor design. Too big for Bedford. All right, we get, we get, John, we get, we get, we, we get the saw, idea. Too John, massive. John. Needs improvement. Boring design. John, we Very get the idea. Massive hotel. John, John, John. Bad design. John. Doesn't blend with John. other buildings. John. Disappointing. John. Monstrosity. John. In keeping. We get the idea. Visual architecture. John. Respect and looks Is very John... bleak. Is that really what we want? I'd like someone who'd listen to me. Rod, is that what, is that, John has a long list of words there. You may have heard some of it. I believe it included the word cheese grater. Yep. Uh, mm, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't sound good, does it, Rod? Uh, I, I, as I said earlier, the, uh, the opinion on the, uh, the how it looks, uh, I've got a number of uh, my members who think it looks great. So, uh, you know, th- th- those views vary from, uh, from individual to individual. not on the public individual. record. This is the public record that's in the planning department. And that is John, what people put down. John, how do you ad- ad- address uh, the, the Rod's issues there, that it, it will um, increase business? It'll reinvigorate Bedford? It could. I'm not sure it will. The They've done research. The uh, research that's been done into this talks about crude estimates. They're not carefully calculated. There's not been enough research. I think, generally, the uses which have been put forward are acceptable. I mean, they're not perfect, but they're acceptable, in my opinion. Um, what is not acceptable is the fact that these buildings breach 10 planning policies. The poli- you know, we have a town centre action plan that says we want attractive, high-quality buildings, um, that the, the site should be a beacon of excellence in architecture that other riverside towns sh- would aspire to, and that residents would feel proud of this development. They don't. They're going to be ashamed of it. It looks well, awful. OK. Absolutely uh, awful. Rod, can I, moving on slightly, can I ask you, what about the other side of, of town, Rod, the old cinema area? With a new cinema and, and shops on the way, surely it's going to be bad for that side of town, isn't it? Well, I'd make a couple of points on that. First of all, um, the, the, we're talking about aspects area, I know, and uh, clearly they've got a the big advantage of a uh, huge amount of car parking and so on. And frankly, competition isn't a bad thing. We're talking a lot about uh, regeneration of town centres and getting people back from out of town things back into town. Uh, And on balance, uh, we believe it's good for the town. We have to recognise that in the event that uh, the the, uh, centre of gravity moves dramatically away from aspects that we might have to look at some mitigation together with the local authorities. But uh, 
I think competition is good at net increase of, of revenue. But th- with two, with two multi-screen cinema, Rod, two multi-screen cinemas, people are going to go to the new one. The, the old one's going to die, isn't it? We've seen it happen in Milton Keynes. It, it, the same thing will happen here. Are you accepting that that's a possibility? You, you have to. You, you can't... Uh, you can plan and plan and plan. Uh, the, the, the dynamics of what happened, who can be absolutely certain. It, it, it has to be a possibility. But I think we'll find that the company. Well, what would you say to the companies on that side of the town, then? Well, there Tough aren't luck. many of them left, frankly. There's been a, a, a migration away, and regrettably, um, that, that's been out of... To, to people going out of town. So is this, I, would this, could this be seen, then, if, if, if you're admitting that, that that side of town is already struggling, that this could be seen as, as kind of the final blow, the final nail in the coffin for that side of town? You've given up on it? No, it's a wake-up call for the uh, businesses who are there, and they've got this competition opportunity. And it, we, in business, we, we, we are very keen on competition. I think there's a really interesting point here that uh, in terms of uh, this, this regeneration, if you look at uh, statistics done by Price Waterhouse and others, um, there's a net reduction in uh, town centre occupation throughout the country. There are hardly any t- town regeneration schemes. Here we've got a fully funded scheme, and I think the really important point about this is that we've already we've got um, businesses from outside of Bedford looking at Bedford as an undeveloped area, as full of potential, and they're already committing to taking space in this new uh, commercial area. Rod, listen, I'm going to just end it there, because I just want John to have the last word. John, you've got 30 seconds. What's, what's your response to that? I think the committee should heed John Bunyan's words. We, you know, we want this development, but he said the right way is often difficult and painful, but it eventually leads to happiness. The wrong way, although quick and easy, leads to sorrow. This will lead to sorrow. It's a rushed development. There hasn't been enough thought. The architecture is just unbelievably bad, and they should listen to the population. John, we have to end it there. Thank you. John Lloyd, one of the residents of Bedford, concerned at the Riverside North development. And the other voice you heard there was Rod Calvert from the Bedford Chamber of Commerce. If you live in the area, what do you think? Sounds like it could be good for, for some business, not the businesses that are, you know, on the other side of the town. It looks like they've been left out to dry, but it could be good for Bedford, could reinvigorate it. Or do you think it looks awful? The word cheese grater was used to describe at least one of the buildings. 08459 four double five five double five. Here's the travel news now with Sophie Tyler. Beds, hearts and bucks travel. BBC Three Counties Radio. Still looking much the same at the moment. Uh, firstly, starting off on the Barnet Bypass, it is queuing where you'd expect between Stirling Corner and Mill Hill Circus at the moment. Also fairly busy on the A1 at the Great North Road, heading through Roxton, just approaching the Black Cat Roundabouts. Now, southbound on the M1, also queuing between Junction 13 at Bedford and 12 at Flittick, while anti-clockwise on the M25 is very slow between 27 at the M11 and 25 at the A10 for Enfield. Also fairly slow as well between 21 at St Albans all the way through to 19 at Watford. Now on the trains, we are looking at disruption on First Capital Connect between Peterborough and King's Cross and between Welling Garden City and Moorgate due to the overrunning engineering works at Oakley Park. Also causing problems as well at the moment on East Coast services. So do check before you travel this morning. Sophie Tyler, BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you, Sophie. At 7.30 now, let's get the news and sport with Serena Farrow. Getting beds, hearts and bugs talking. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. Good morning. A Milton Keynes man fears he'll be kicked out of his home if he loses his council tax benefit. From next week, the government's scrapping the subsidy. Elsewhere, planners are meeting this evening to determine whether or not to go ahead with a new leisure complex in the centre of Bedford. David Cameron will set out plans to impose tougher curbs on immigrants who want to claim unemployment benefits in the UK. And traffic may grind to a standstill in parts of Luton today, with up to 300 cars joining a protest. It's over the planned loss of free bus travel to school. Cool. That's the news. Now let's move on to all the morning sport. Beds, Hearts and Bucks Sports. BBC Three Counties Radio. Kicking off with cricket, then in England have a massive fight to avoid a series defeat after being outplayed on the fourth day of the final test against New Zealand. The home side declared on 240 for six, leaving England to chase a world record target of 481 to win. 
Football then and Stevenage lost 3-1 against Tranmere yesterday. The managerless side remained 15th in League One. Elsewhere, the Watford striker Matej Vidra has won the Championship Player of the Year award. The Hornets' leading goalscorer is on international duty with the Czech Republic, so it meant his manager Gianfranco Zola picked up the award on his behalf last night. Luton Town manager says they still have a slim chance of making the conference playoffs. That's despite not winning at the weekend. The Hatters actually drew 0-0 at home to Tamworth, but John still is optimistic. I wouldn't say that it's it's the end. It's just become a touch more difficult, um, but not the end. No, because football a funny game who knows you know out of that nine we might win eight and that might just scare one or two Rugby now and Saracens move five points clear at the top of the Premiership with a dominant 27 points to 12 victory over third placed Harlequins. Saracens director of rugby Mark McCall was happy with the result. We had some good opportunities made some great breaks into their 22 and came away with with, with relative nothing so the, the try that we scored before half time and equally the try just after half time was, uh, was very important Controversial F1, the team principal of Milton Keynes-based Red Bulls admitted he'll have clear the air talks with Sebastian Vettel. It comes after the Formula One world champion defied his order not to overtake teammate Mark Webber. The Australian had been leading the Malaysian Grand Prix after the final pit stops, but Vettel went to the front to claim victory. Hertfordshire's Lewis Hamilton, by the way, came third. BBC Three Counties Radio, more from me at eight. Across beds, hearts and bucks, this is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio. Morning, this is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio, 7.33 on Monday morning. 08459 four double five five double five is the telephone number if you want to give us a call. Lots coming up between now and 8 o'clock, including after two years of fighting, the residents of Butley Road in Luton could lose the land behind their homes as early as tonight. Also, there'll be an extra 300 cars on the road in Luton this morning as parents protest over the planned loss of free bus travel to Cardinal Newman Roman Catholic School. And should larger people be charged more to fly? Well, one professor thinks they should because their extra weight is using more fuel. If you want to give us a call, 08459 455 555 is the telephone number. You can go to the Facebook page and comment on any of those stories, facebook.com forward slash BBC 3CR. Um, We'll move on to the, uh, the, the housing situation in a second. But before that, should larger people be forced to pay more to travel? Well, a Norwegian professor wants uh, airlines to charge air passengers by the pound. Uh, Dr Barrett uh, Batter believes that airlines should charge passengers according to how much they weigh. So heavier passengers would pay more for their plane tickets and lighter ones less because every kilo means using more fuel. Well, our reporter Justin Daly, weighing in at 13 and three quarter stone and uh, let's be honest, is ripped, uh, has been out <laughs> asking people what you think, Justin. Yes, thank you, Ian. In the first hour, most people said, you know what, this professor's comments, absolutely spot on. Most yep. people I spoke to totally agreed. Well, in the last 30 minutes at Luton Airport, the, the opinions have changed slightly. Mm. Here's some more that have just come in. Well, hey, here's a man in a kilt. Tom, uh, welcome to the programme. Heading off to the Scotland game. What's your thoughts on what this professor's saying about overweight people? Has he got a point here? Um, I don't think so, to be truthful. Um, it's, it is a difficult one, but it's, some people are overweight because basically they're born that way, you know, and it's, it's, it's a difficult one. I, I do do appreciate the comments, uh, what, what people say about people being overweight and being charged. That's fine, but, you know, it, it can be basically not their fault. It's very, very difficult to draw the line in that situation. How would you police something like that? It's all very well in exactly, theory, but yeah. how would it work in reality? Exactly. Well, it wouldn't. You know, that's the problem. Well, Jackie, you think the professor's comments are highly offensive. Can you tell us why that's the case? I just seem to think that it's um, like they, they make an allowance for passengers. They ha- must have a, a quota for passengers. And if somebody is really heavy and they require two seats, then that, that's, uh, they do that certainly in the States. So they must know that you know, they have a quota for, for passengers anyway. So they weigh your luggage, they pay you for your, you know, charge you for your luggage... <laughs> You know, exorbitant. So, yeah, I don't think that's right. And a word for yourself, Steve. Um, overweight passengers, should they be charged by the kilo, by the pound? Or what, what do you think? Uh, no, I think they should just be charged like in the old days when you just got a flat rate fare. There were no add ons, no additions, no taxes. It was just like, that's the price you pay and that's, that's it. And you're saying that as somebody who's not overweight as well? Uh, yeah, yeah. 
Well, it, the, the, the tide is turning. The tide's mm. turning slightly on Facebook as well. Initially, it was everyone saying, oh, yeah, this makes great sense. But it, it seems to be um, spreading out a, a, a little bit more. Uh, it's, an, it's an interesting one. 08459 four double five five double five. Justin, are you at that school yet? I'm going to be heading off very, very soon. Big protest uh, in Luton this morning. Heading off to the Cardinal Newman School. Uh, we expect extra traffic. Quite whether it will grind to a standstill, I don't know. But um, we believe up to 300 cars joining this protest over a potential loss of free bus travel to the school. So full details on the way before 8 o'clock. Brilliant, Justin. We'll speak to you a bit later on. Thank you. Now, the residents of Butley Road in Luton have been fighting to keep the land behind their homes as open space for over two years. The council want to give the land to developers to build homes which are in desperate need in the town. Residents have tried to stop the plans by applying for the land to be designated as a village green. But we told you on this programme last week they'd been unsuccessful. Finally, after so many years of fighting, it's expected that the council will approve the plan to start the process to build homes tonight. Well, I'm joined now by Stephanie Stiff, who's a resident who's been campaigning against the plans. Morning, Stephanie. Morning. Uh, And on the line is Labour councillor Tom Shaw, the executive member in charge of housing in Luton. Morning, Tom. Morning, Ian. Tom, come to you in a second. Stephanie, uh, sum up what you see as a problem. The problem is that land is used by everybody around, not just the people in our road. Um, It's a big open space. It's right next to the motorway. Um, All the children use it, and they keep going on about Luton in Harmony. If you go to our field, you'll see every ethnicity playing together. They all join in. We look after our field. You won't find it full of rubbish. Mm. Um, The old people use it. Dog walkers use it. Joggers use it. It's the only space anywhere near our area that everyone can use freely and we always have done you've lost the battle though haven't you now we've got other things up our sleeve at the moment we are looking into appeal um our problem is we are just ordinary people um the council have used our council tax money um so i've actually paid for them to tell me no Mm. um they paid for the barristers and that we didn't have barristers we can't afford that we're just normal people tom you're not listening to the normal people I am listening to the normal people. I've had this discussion Saturday morning at my surgery. But at the end of the day, I've got 5,500 people in in uh, need of housing. I've got 2,000 on the list as an emergency. And I've got over 160 families in Tempe accommodation outside Luton. But you're not going to get much council housing out of this, are you? We get shared, yeah, but this is just one one site in fee site for all started at the same time. Right, how many, houses you, how, many, site. how many houses are you going to get on this? 15? On this, 15 council houses and 15 shared ownership. Well, it's, that, that's, that's, that's nothing, is it? That's not even going to uh, touch the problem. It's not going to touch a problem, but if we don't do anything, we've lost all the Section 106 agreement sites across the town. We've got to build somewhere. You gave the land away, this and two other pieces of land, you gave it to the developer... And it's not a developer, it's an housing association. Okay. Everyone's calling it a developer. OK, but you, you gave yeah. it away. You gave away three pieces yeah. of land. And you let them off £1 million pounds of special payments. All for no. 23 affordable houses. No. They don't get that off one. Right, what you've got now is a Section 106 agreement when a developer comes yes. in for a planning permission. Yes. The developer comes in and he negotiates with the planning department, the Section 106 And you let them agreement. off that £1.1 £1. 1 million pounds of Section 106, didn't you? Completely wrong. Put, put, put me right. 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 What it is is this is a contracted job. It's a partnership between us and the association. Right. And a lot of the stuff has been put into the contract instead of the section one hundred and six. Right. All for every million pound we get an apprentice. Uh, Bradley Road is going to have a children's playground put there. So hang on. You get. Getting, a, so tell me exactly what you're getting instead of the one point one million pounds a playground. Playground, 30 apprenticeships, a £1,000 for every unit for the 209 units. That gives us two hundred, two hundred nine thousand pounds alone. Right. £100,000 for the children's playground, 30 odd apprentices, fully employed for the full length of the apprenticeship. Would you not rather have had the £1.1 million? Pounds? Well, that would have bought us 10 houses. Right. But said you said you're, you're, getting, you're, getting, you're getting a playground and a, and a few apprenticeships. No, the apprenticeships are very important with the amount of young unemployed we've got. Oh, of the course town. they are, but you could have, just think of what yeah. you could have done with that £1.1 £1. 1 million. Pounds. We'd have paid for the 30 apprentices. That's it. You know, this is an, this negotiations have gone on a long time. This is a second Why did you give the land away? Because that's what you do to get the full nomination. You don't, you you don't sell the land. To, you don't sell the land to get the money for it. No, we've done it for twenty years. What you right. do, you give the land to the association in exchange for permanent nomination rights into all the rented properties. Right. 
So we get houses where... But you've you know, not got many houses, though, Tom, have them. you? You haven't got many houses, that's the thing. Not, not in this game, we haven't got many at so all. So you've, no, no, no. you've given away this, this land for not many houses. I, I, listen, I'm not a businessman or a property developer. No. It doesn't sound like a good deal to me. Right, you, uh, the land, the total value of the land is £1.5 million, pound, all fee sites. In exchange for that, we're getting a number of houses that will cost us £6.5 7 million pound to build. And we get permanent nomination rights to those properties. So it's our people off our list are going into the shared ownership and the rented properties. Stephanie, Tom, makes a, Tom makes a good point, doesn't he, that, that, that it's going to help with housing? No. <laughs> they've got... Um, <clears throat> excuse me. They've just put up for sale the site at Wesley's, mm. which is council-owned. It's a brownfield site, and they've got that up for sale because apparently they need the money. Mm. And that's what Tom said last time. We need the money, so we're selling that site. Well, wait a minute... That doesn't make sense. If they've got a huge site, then that Catalyst Homes, who are the developers or the housing association, could have part of that land. And not only that, this 106 money, when you go through their thing in the planning meeting, it does actually state that um, all three sites are having a reduced financial contribution of under half a million for all three sites. Yet when they did their sums, the education department said just for our site... They need an influx of £371,386. Transport, want £101,088. You add those up, that's nearly the money they've got for the whole lot. Tom? So where's the money coming from from the other two sites? Tom? Well, Stephanie can't have it both ways, can she? So what she's talking about is selling off Wesley. Wesley's being sold off for private housing. Uh, so the council gets the money in there. So it's going to be an housing site. And the other argument is we just, the Section 106, if we followed the present government guidelines, we'd get absolutely nothing for the site. So we've changed all the rules. But the money, from the, the, the money from the 106, that would normally go on schools, that would go on roads, that would go on community centres. It would, 100%, but the Section 106 is now on no longer there. The Vauxhall well, no, because you've, you've, you've given them, you've given them, you've no, let them off the 106. No, we haven't let them off all the 106, and Stephanie's just said it herself with the half a million pound. But this is, all the stuff we would normally get in the Section 106 is negotiated as part of this contract. But the, and the other argument, what uh, has just been fetched up is, Section 106s are now gone. We had 92 houses on the Vauxhall site, on the plateau. The top part of the They go in April, side. don't they? Uh, yeah, but everyone's so, withdrawn the planning so position. So, the they've yeah, not been withdrawn. Listen, we're running out of time. Very quickly, Stephanie, you've got 30 seconds. What do, you, what do you want to say to Tom? Well, Tom and the Labour Party who run this council need to listen to the people of Luton. They want love Luton, yet they're taking everything that's nice about Luton away, and they can purely because they're in control. They take no notice of any of us. Tom, you're taking away all the nice bits of Luton and you're not listening. Completely wrong. <laughs> yeah, that'd be the day. <laughs> yeah, wrong. You don't listen. Listen all the time. Listen to the people who have to live in Enfield or in Milton Keynes in Tempe accommodation. Well, I've got stop to listen taking to them, them in from London. You we take, don't take people. Them in from London. You told us that. You don't told a London, lot of people we, you take people whoa, 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 in from whoa. London, they have no. to stay in Luton, excuse me, for one year and one day, which London paid yeah. for, we, and we then we take, take over their housing. Stephanie, let, let's we, have Tom We don't take them in, they send them to us. And you there's a meeting on no. April of, There's a meeting on April, we can't, we're not allowed to. There's a meeting <laughs> on April the 5th to try and come to an arrangement with all the London boroughs to stop them sending them to Luton. OK, listen, we have to end it there. This is, I think that's something else we can investigate. Stephanie, thank you very much for coming in. Considering you were nervous, I thought you did a cracking job. I, I might take the rest of the morning off. You can oh, do we this. are just so cross about I it. Tell. It's we'll, the only space we've got for the kids to play. We will be following this story closely, Stephanie. Okay. Thank you very much for coming in. And as uh, Labour councillor Tom Shaw, always good to have you on the show. Thank you very much indeed. You can give us a call and let us know your views on that. We'll speak to you after the travel. It's Sophie. Beds, hearts and bucks travel. BBC Three Counties Radio. Looking busy on the motorways at the moment, southbound on the M1, queuing between 14 at Milton Keynes and 13 at Bedford. While anti-clockwise on the M25, it is slow as well, between 27 at the M11 and 25 at the A10 for Enfield. Also busy between 21 at St Albans and 19 at Watford and 17 at Maple Cross and 16 at the M40. Now fairly heavy as well, uh, northbound on the M40, just coming off at the A40 at the Denham Roundabout and Junction 1A at the M25. And also on the Barnet Bypass, southbound still queuing between 
Stirling Corner and Mill Hill Circus and on the A10 at the Great Cambridge Road southbound through Chesant also busy as well between Winston Churchill Way and Lieutenant Ellis Way everything else on the roads not too bad do you have disruption though on First Capital Connect between Peterborough and King's Cross and Welling Garden City and Moorgate all due to the overrunning engineering works at Oakley Park also affecting things on the East Coast services and again on East Coast delays of 15 minutes between uh, King's Cross and Doncaster all the way up to the north there following a broken down train just around Peterborough so do check before you travel this morning Sophie Tyler BBC Three Counties Radio Thank you Sophie Morning it's 7.46 it's Monday the 25th of March I'm Ian Lee and these are your headlines on BBC Three Counties Radio A Milton Keynes man says he'll lose his home without his council tax benefit which he'll stop receiving next week A meeting in Luton tonight will decide whether or not to build homes near Butley Road. And in sport, Watford striker Matej Vidra has won the Championship Player of the Year award. Well done, he. Coming up, there could be an extra 300 cars on the roads in Luton this morning as parents protest over the planned loss of free bus travel to Cardinal Newman Roman Catholic School. Our traffic chaos correspondent Justin Daly will be there live before 8am. If you're involved in that, could you give us a call? 08459 455 555. But now let's get the latest weather with Sarah Thornton. Beds, hearts and bucks weather. BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you very much. A very good morning to you. It's a bitterly cold start out there. Still minus two at Wickham, minus one elsewhere. And some places have reached the dizzy heights of the freezing mark at the moment. There's not a lot of sunshine around to start the day, but we may well see a little bit coming through. Generally looking at a dry day today across the three counties, but it will stay very cold indeed. We'll see a high on the thermometer of just plus three, perhaps plus four Celsius. Some spots, though, may not even get as high as that. And with that Nagging northeasterly wind, it will feel much colder. A few flurries to come through, but as I say, a little bit of brightness potentially by the end of the afternoon. Bright or potentially just towards the northeast, some sunny spells just running in by the end of the day. And then tonight, a few breaks in the cloud, temperatures again falling widely to freezing or below. And tomorrow morning will be another very cold start. But like this morning, not expecting to do too much scraping on the cars. The air is still very dry. We'll keep that nagging northeasterly wind. Staying fairly dry through the next few days a few flurries at times but that's about the most of it until friday that is and good friday there's some rain coming up from the southwest which as it meets the colder air could potentially turn to snow it's still a long way in the forecast we'll keep posted right here on bbc 3cr thank you very much indeed on april the 1st the welfare system undergoes its biggest change for 60 years We're determined to reform welfare so that work always pays. There'll be new benefits, changes to existing ones and more responsibility for local government. They're not being guinea pigs, they're actually getting very, very close support and advice and actually I think this will be a tremendous success story. This week we'll be finding out what these radical changes really mean to beds, hearts and bucks. We're going to be £908 worse off. As usually it just feels like we're wading through mud with this one. Now that I'm on benefits I'm actually better off. Benefit changes, making it clear. This week on BBC. Three Counties Radio. Planners are going to make a final decision tonight on whether to approve a new £50 million leisure complex in Bedford. We've heard it described as ugly, an eyesore, cheese grater. I still don't quite get the cheese grater reference, but uh, maybe I'll look at the plans a little bit more closely. Lots of you calling in this morning uh, on this. Noel's from Kempston. Morning, Noel. Morning, Ian. Uh, Do you think this uh, development plan in Bedford is a good idea or or not so good? Well, I think one of the things that I heard you sort of mention as you were interviewing um, earlier on, uh, which I don't think really um, you you seem to get a very sort of good answer yourself to, was um, in regards to this idea that Part of the development, I believe, is including another six-screen cinema, which we have a six-screen cinema at the moment. And I'm just sort of thinking, is that really going to offer people of Bedford, say, more choice? As you say, um, I think as your interviewer said, or the person who was interviewing said, who knows, maybe what the older cinema may struggle to, struggle to compete and may... That was Rod Calvert, who's from the Bedford yeah. Chamber of Commerce, Commerce, and I did ask him w- what the effect would be on that other side of town with uh, that, that's already got the cinema. And he, well, he said it would be a wake-up call for the businesses. Well, if the businesses are struggling, yeah. putting the same businesses on the other side of town isn't going to help, is it? Well, I, I, so I really can't see how it's going to benefit. Are we going to end up? 
I mean, like, the other week I went to watch a movie, which is very rare for me, I'll be honest with you. I went to see the um, movie Oz the Grand Powerful. Oh, is, that, is had, it any good? I quite enjoyed it. I saw it in 3D, which was probably why I liked it. Yeah. And, of course, it had a 3D option and a 2D option, which took out two out of the four screens. Yeah. So what are we going to get then suddenly, say, a big film next year at both cinemas, um, maybe a couple of films where you'll have, say, 12 screens, but eight of them be showing two films. i tell you what will happen. I don't, by the way, I don't like 3D, and I would, I would always save my money to watch the 3D, but it, the same thing happened in Milton Keynes. Yeah. There, another cinema opened up, and the first cinema, everyone, everyone stopped going to it. Exactly. Everyone wants to go to the new, smarter, trendier one. Yeah, and then even in Milton Keynes, um, I'm sure even there's, like, sort of 20-plus screens there, from what I see looking at the listings this week. Um, the big movies are at both um, cinemas, and so, really, are you getting that much extra choice? Because um, they both obviously want to show the big um, blockbuster. They don't want to uh, be missing out on stuff like that. No, listen, we've got to end it there. Thank you very much. Um, I, I do think once you open another cinema, everyone goes to the smarter, newer, cleaner cinema. And the, 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 the original one, who wants to go and sit in an old cinema? Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five. Now, traffic could grind to a standstill in parts of Luton today. The school run is normally bad enough, but today there could be up to three hundred cars joining a protest over the planned loss of free bus travel to school for six hundred pupils. The parents are planning to drive to Cardinal Newman Roman Catholic School to drop off and collect their children today instead of sending them on the bus. Well, our travel correspondent Justin Dealey is at the Sacred Heart Roman Catholic Church in Stopsley, from where most of the parents will be setting off shortly. Justin, set the scene for us. What, what's happening there at the moment? Well, Ian, I'm surrounded by lots of uh, angry mums who have uh, just started to arrive in the last ten minutes or so. They're going to be heading off to the Cardinal Newman School in the next five minutes or so. Clearly not happy about this situation, about any sort of funding that's being cut towards free bus travel here in Luton. One of those parents is Antoinette Cotella, who's the spokeswoman for the Cardinal Newman Preserve Our School Transport Committee. Can you just describe how angry you are this morning? Because clearly this protest is, is getting a lot of people here. How do you feel? We're all very, very angry about what's going on here. Uh, Hazel Simmons, eight years ago, promised us that this would not happen again, and we're back here fighting for the funding on the buses again. Uh, we want weren't informed about this until after we put our admissions forms in in October time. Uh, the, the Catholic community is a strong community in Luton that puts a lot of time and effort back into the, into the town and for the buses to be taken away they're taking the heart out of the community. So how much would this cost you then every single month, every single year as a parent if this service was cut then? It's, you, you're talking about uh, £20 a week, £80 a month, roughly about £600 per child per year. Could you afford that? No and there's some parents who've got two or three kids so you count that up in your head that's an awful lot of money. I mean, some people would say, why can't your children simply walk to school? Uh, you're talking kids that's outside a three mile radius, sometimes four or five miles. Would you send an 11 year old down four or five miles for a walk every day of the week? I don't think so. But why couldn't you get a school nearer to where you live then? Uh, a lot of schools nearer to us, the, the catchment area schools are full. Uh, and remember, it is about our faith at the end of the day. We want to follow through with our children with the Catholic faith. Um, and that's very, very important to the community, basically. This is not a done deal yet, so it hasn't no. quite been lost. When did you first find out it could potentially go though, this funding? Uh, we found out around December time after we had our admissions forms put in to the schools at that stage. So we've been fighting it since then. So what's going to be happening today? I'm looking here in this car park. More and more cars are turning up. More and more banners and ribbons are being shown. Um, what exactly is going to be happening in Luton very, very soon? Well, the whole idea is to get out on the road, drop your kids to Cardinal and Newman because one of the things we want to show the council is if the buses go, people are going to have to drive their kids to school and the congestion on the roads to Luton is going to be an absolute disaster, especially on the A6 and Warden Hills where Cardinal Newman is. So that's the whole idea. And I think that's what the council is really scared of, is the congestion problems. So effectively, what you're trying to do this morning is cause as much chaos as possible. Uh, uh, well, to prove to the council, if they go ahead with this, this is what's going to be happening from September, day in, day out. Uh, and it's a risk to the blue lights trying to get up, which is what we don't want to do, but the reality is from September that's what's going to happen. What would you say to any motorists listening to this right now, who's in their car in Lucent, they're trying to get to work, and they think what you're doing is totally outrageous. What would you say to those people? Uh, you know, I, I, I understand people might be uh, anxious about it. My husband's trying to 
to get to work this morning. I've just came back from a night shift. But the reality is, if we sit back and let the council do this, then the next set of people they're going to pick on for whatever reasons regarding funding could be you. So you, we've got to get out and fight this. It's very important. You're doing this this afternoon as well. Yes, You're we also are. going to the town hall this evening. Yes. Hazel Simmons, the leader of Luton Borough Council, will yes. be live on the programme before nine. I guarantee you, she will be listening to this right yes. now. What is your message to Hazel Simmons? Hazel, we voted you in eight years ago on this. You supported us on it. You seem to have gone back on your ward. Really, really think hard. This is a big, strong community. And we, we, we can turn it around. We can, we, we, can, we can ignore Hazel and not have her voted back in again. So please listen to us on it. Yes or no, will you win this fight? Yes, we will. 150%. Okay, clearly very passionate. Kim, a final word for yourself. Um, you're here this morning with lots of other parents. Yes. How angry do you feel about these cuts, potential cuts? I am fuming. Um, as such, it doesn't affect me financially, but it will affect me. My child goes to Cardin Newman, and even though they're not within the, they're not outside the three mile limit, it isn't just about the, the buses as such, it's the congestion, it's everything else, and it's constantly the council cutting money from us again and again. Um, it just always seems to be us that's been penalised. And these ribbons, can you describe what these ribbons are about for me? These ribbons, blue to represent Cardinal Newman, and basically they're just a way to show people this is the amount of extra traffic that's going to be on the roads if the, the funding is cut for denominational buses. Thank you very much indeed for your time, much appreciated. You. There you go, lots of passion here, Ian. Justin, very quickly, some mm, Peter mm. has posted on Facebook, this is this is terribly unsafe. Uh, it's dangerous to school kids, and if anybody needs an emergency vehicle, what what, what would the protesters say about that? Let me just put that point to Antoinette. Um, somebody, one of our listeners here, is making a comment here saying what you're doing this morning is totally unsafe for emergency vehicles if they need to get through also the kids outside the school it's safe it's not safe sorry how would you answer that well we've got stewards down there and on top of that we have informed the police and the council about what has happened this morning so they are aware of what's going on mm. i do understand yet yeah, there is an element of risk but are we going to sit back what's going to happen from september onwards if we don't win the fight this is going to happen day in day out and then there's an element of risk every day of the week okay. there you go let's answer that question so in just a second Ian, we're going to be heading off uh, to Cardinal Newman. We're here live at the moment at the Sacred Heart Roman Catholic Church and as you've heard there from Antoinette, um, this battle will go on and as far as she's concerned and other parents here, they will win this battle. They do not want to see free bus funding going. Justin, thank you very much indeed. Well, the council says travel arrangements for pupils and students between their homes and school is costing the authority more than £1 million. Uh, the council says it wrote to parents at Cardinal uh, Newman High School affected by the proposal explaining how to respond to the consultation. More than 900 Hundred responses have been received and the council's executive is scheduled to make that final decision on April the 29th. 08459 455 555 Let's get the travel news now with Sophie Tyler. Beds, hearts and bucks travel. BBC Three Counties Radio. Heading north on the Barnet Bypass at the moment. One lane is closed following a broken down vehicle around Weymouth Avenue. Lane 2 is the lane that is closed at the moment. Now southbound on the M1 looking slow between 12 at Flittick and 11 at Dunstable. Also slow again between uh, 14 at Milton Keynes and 13 at Bedford. While anti-clockwise on the M25 still looking slow where you'd expect between 27 at the M11 and 25 at the A10 for Enfield. Also queuing between 20 at Kings Langley all the way through to 16 at the M40. Now, everything else not looking too bad out there at the moment a few usual delays but nothing that's going to hold you up for too long but don't forget on first capital connect we have disruption between peter and king's cross and welling garden city in moorgate due to the overrunning engineering works also causing problems on east coast services and delays of 50 minutes on east coast as well between king's cross heading up towards the north following a broken down train at peterborough sophie tyler bbc three counties radio thank you sophie well, lots coming up in the next hour, including more of your calls on the uh, £50 million proposed development in Bedford. Well, you seem to be furious about it. Does anybody out there support it? We'll talk more after the news with Serena. Getting beds, hearts and bugs talking. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. Good morning, the headlines. Changes to council tax benefit means Buckingham Shaman says it'll be a nightmare. Decision of homes to be built in Luton and what the player is best in the league. BBC Three Counties Radio. A Milton Keynes man fears he'll be kicked out of his home if he loses his council tax benefit. From next week, the government's scrapping the subsidy. It means Elliot Lowe will now have to pay 20% of his council tax bill. That's something he says he can't afford. You know, I don't want to leave because my wife's got her family here and the kids have got start to go up in my young my oldest will be nine in June. The Department of Work and Pensions have written to probably virtually everybody who won benefits and said 
due to the cap coming in, you're set to lose up to X amount from your housing benefit unless you qualify to be exempt from the cap if you're in a certain group of employment support allowance or you have other benefits. Staying with that story and stay listening to hear more from the Resolution Foundation. That's an independent organisation which aims to improve outcomes for people on low and modest incomes. They'll be speaking to Ian Lee here on BBC Three Counties Radio shortly. In other news, the residents of Butley Road in Luton have been fighting to keep the land behind their homes as open space. The council want to give the land to developers in order to build houses. Locals have tried to stop the plans by applying for the land to be designated as a village green, but have so far proven unsuccessful. After so many years, it's expected that the council will tonight approve the plan. Labour councillor Tom Shaw, in, who's in charge of housing in the town, explains what will happen. Uh, the land, the total value of the land is £1.5 million, pound, all fee side. In exchange for that, we're getting a number of houses that will cost us £6.5, £7 million pound to build. And we get permanent nomination rights to those properties. So it's our people off our list are going into the shared ownership and the rented properties. David Cameron will set out plans to impose tougher curbs on immigrants who want to claim unemployment benefits in the UK. In a speech later on, he'll say that migrants can no longer expect something for nothing. Traffic may grind to a standstill in parts of Luton today with up to 300 cars joining a protest. It's over the planned loss of free bus travel to school. Ewan Duncan has the details. The fleet of cars will travel from Stopsley to Cardinal Newman Roman Catholic School. Parents are angry that Luton Borough Council is proposing to scrap the Faith School bus service. They say pupils could be forced to catch two buses if the plans are approved, while some children could be withdrawn from the school if alternative transport proves too expensive. The council says this type of travel is costing the authority more than £1 million a year and it's exploring alternatives. The council executive is scheduled to make a final decision on April 29th. Sport now on the Watford striker Matez Ridra has won the Championship Player of the Year award. The Hornets' leading goalscorer is on international duty at the moment, though, with the Czech Republic. Weather then, and it um, could set to see a bit of odd little snow here and there. I don't know, it doesn't look snowy though, does it? It's flipping cold, I'll tell you that. It's cold, but apparently it's only five degrees Celsius, though when I got in the motor, it was about minus one. It's too cold, too cold. But they do that thing, don't they? It's too cold to snow. How can it be too cold to snow? Have you ever been to the North Pole? It's freezing up there. Yeah, well, it's precipitation and all that, isn't it? It is. It does kind of make sense. Look at, you, then it ice. Look at you and your fancy words, Serena. Yeah. Anything else? <laughs> That'll do, actually. I've had enough now. Good. <laughs> Ta ta. <laughs> Freestyle! I was just really digging the, uh, the theme tune to this show. What well, wonderful. Great stuff. Great stuff. Morning, this is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. Three minutes past eight. It is cold out there. I mean, really cold. I've, I can't find my scarf. I've lost so many things this weekend, including my house keys and my scarf. I'm hoping... I had a hire car for a few days last week. I'm hoping beyond hope... Uh, two things. One, that they're in the hire car. And two, that the hire car company are reputable and won't break into my house with my keys and steal my things. So, I um, and I've lost my scarf. Lots of things went this weekend. I'm getting old. Anyway, coming up between now and nine o'clock. Lots of things that I think you might want to have your say on. Phone's been very busy this morning. I appreciate that. We'll, we'll get to as many phone calls as we can. Where you are in the country could affect how much council tax benefit you will lose from next month. We'll hear from a man who may have to leave Milton Keynes because of it. Ugly, too blocky, cheese grater... Too big. No, not a description of me. Just some of the reasons why John from Bedford doesn't want a new £50 million leisure complex in the town. A final decision could be made tonight. And larger people should pay more to fly. Their weight costs more fuel, so it's only fair. Those are the views of a Norwegian professor. What do you think? 08459 455 555. We'd love to speak to um, a larger person. What do you think on this? Is it? A, would you be embarrassed to be forced to stand on some scales before you board your aeroplane? 08459 four double five five double five, or you can text uh, 81333. Start your text 3CR. BBC Three Counties Radio. You can also follow me on Twitter at Ian Lee I A I N L W E. And at BBC 3CR, we, we tweet lots of pictures and things that are relevant to the show, so always worth following us if you're on the Twitter net. Now, where you are in the country could affect how much council tax benefit you'll lose from next month. 
One Milton Keynes man says he will have to move out of the town if his council tax benefit is lost. Elliot Lowe, who has a disabled child and is due to lose other benefits come April, spoke to me earlier. You know, I don't want to leave because my wife's got her family here and the kids have started to grow up here. My my oldest will be nine in June. But I can't really see any other alternative. The government have said, well, the Department of Work and Pensions have written to probably virtually everybody who won benefits and said, um, due to the cap coming in, you're set to lose up to X amount from your housing benefit unless you qualify to be exempt from the cap if you're in a certain group of employment support allowance or you have other benefits. Now, when you speak to the Department for Work and Pensions, they say, yes, you're in this group, and because you've got a disabled child, you won't be capped, but speak to your local council. When you speak to your local council, the information they give you is completely different. So it sounds to me, and it seems to me, the Department for Work and Pensions are saying one thing, and the council is saying completely a different thing, and neither of the two know what's actually happening. Well, joined now by uh, two guests on the line. First up is a political commentator and former Buckinghamshire resident, David Vance, who thinks everyone should have to pay their council tax. Morning, David. Good morning, Ian. I'll come to you in a second. First, I want to say hello to Matthew Pennycook. He's from the Resolution Foundation, an independent research and policy organisation which aims to improve outcomes for people on low and modest incomes. Morning, Matthew. Morning, Ian. Matthew, is Elliot's story a, a typical example of the stories you've been hearing? Um, I think it's typical in lots of parts of the country because what we found is that about three quarters of councils are going to introduce less generous systems of council tax support because they basically don't feel able to absorb the cut in funding which the government has passed down in alongside giving control for council tax support to local councils. So I think Ian's story will be a typical one up and down the country, yeah. Well, you did research into the scrapping of the council tax benefit. What, what did you find, Matthew? Well, what we found was that um, councils face a very stark choice. What the government has done is handed support to them with a 10% funding cut and also with rules which mean pensioner levels of support can't be touched. And that leaves them with a very stark choice. They can either reduce support for working age people or absorb the cut. Now, a quarter of them do feel able to absorb the cut, sometimes only for a year, but three quarters are introducing less generous of systems of support. And what that means for about up to 3 million um, working age families across the country that means a re- reduction in support sometimes of up to um, quite a high percentage of their council tax bill so what we found for example is that working single parents will could see up to about 500 pounds extra on their council tax um, from the 1st of April in parts of the country and what are your concerns about this well, our concerns, a couple of concerns. One is that this group of people have already taken quite a hit over the last couple of years. Reductions in tax credits and other in-work support. Uh, stagnant wages for those who are working and who receive some council tax support. And other things. So they've already taken quite a squeeze on their household income and they're not spending money in the economy as a result. But the other wider concern is I think that reform, the reform of council tax benefit, didn't have to look like this. There are other ways you could have done it. And you, the government didn't have to hand control to local authorities so we have 326 different schemes at the same time as protecting pensioners and cutting funding and so what we have is this postcode lottery that as your uh, the caller has mentioned cuts across some of the other welcome simplification of the benefit system that the government have put through david why are you against council tax benefit well you see Ian, and the first th- the first thing i would say is you know it seems reasonable to me that everyone should make at least some contribution towards the local council services that they consume. You know, there's a fairness and indeed an equality to the proposition that if you consume a service, you must pay a little, a little towards it. However, if you object to this principle, then what you're actually saying is that those who are already paying council tax need to pay much more so that others may pay nothing. Now, surely that's unfair. And, you know, I have to say, and I also think that the the Resolution Foundation, um, founded by a millionaire Labour Party donor, run by Gordon Brown's former former Deputy Chief of Staff, are also looking at this from precisely the wrong end of the telescope, because what they're omitting is the simple fact that if local government could learn to be efficient, then even this cut would not affect those on benefits and those concerned. The central issue here, actually, is local council priorities with what they do with our cash. And I think we should be disgusted by the fact that some councils in England are wanting to pass on up to 20% to to, to, uh, ratepayers rather than deal with their own bloated, bureaucratic inefficiency. 
Well, this is happening and it is getting passed on, on, on to, to members of society, possibly right. vulnerable members of society uh, and those who are very poor. Have you got any sympathy for them, David? I, I've got sympathy for people uh, who have to suffer from inefficient councils. But, I mean, you know, that's the point, Ian. The issue here is the councils, and that's what the Resolution Foundation are missing. If councils spent less money on lavishing funding on themselves, their staff, and their, 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 their uh, luxurious... Uh, council facilities, then perhaps they could afford to cut what they charge us and give us all a break. So that's where you need to look. You need to look at the inefficiencies of councils. And you also need to accept the fact that I think it is fair, Ian, that people should pay a little towards the services that they consume. I mean, I think that's a very reasonable proposition. Matthew, the, the, let's put aside the, the, the lavish, luxurious surroundings <laughs> that the councils are, are living and working in. It, it, well, it, it, makes, it makes sense, doesn't it, Matthew, that, that everyone should contribute something towards the local services. I, I pay my council tax. Why shouldn't everyone else contribute something? Uh, well, it's interesting for a start that David didn't dispute the figures or the research when he attacked that. When it no, comes to local... Coming from a Labour, a Labour Party... Uh, okay, well, well let's, let's, let's deal with the organisation. We, I don't need to. Can we speak about the issues? When, in you terms of the off. principle of everyone paying something, I mean, that's a fair viewpoint that many will take. It's actually the same logic that was behind the community charge, the poll tax. And council tax and council tax benefit, which replaced that, acknowledge that some people on very low incomes, and we're talking about people who are only on the minimum wage or just above, should not have to pay as much or anything to that services and they would be supported. So local authorities, yes, can make savings, but local authorities up and down the country have faced swinging cuts over the last couple of years. They're facing rising demands from social care and other pressures, and many simply can't afford to absorb the cut. And that's why they're passing on. I think many are doing it with a heavy heart. No one is relishing in any council up and down the country having to pass on these costs. But how the do, way they're you know that? done. You, you've no re- I, I mean, f- one thing that you, you actually have forgotten to mention is that quite a few councils across the country over the past couple of years are, have, have had more and more people on their staff earning in excess of £50,000 a year. So I, I repeat my point that the issue is bloated council inefficiency. And, I mean, you, I'm afraid your report doesn't deal with that at all. And I think that's a rather strange omission. But, David, that, that, that is, is a possibility. But I'm hearing every day on, show, on this show and other shows on, yeah. on Three Counties Radio that, that councils are making cuts on every level. And it is getting passed down to those who can't afford it. Like Elliot, who we spoke to earlier on, who's, who's a full-time carer, looks after his, his son, who's poorly, uh, and he's suddenly got to pay 20% council tax. What would you say to, to someone in that situation? Well, what I would say is that he, he does need to look to his local council. I mean, the fact of the matter is you're suggesting, in that the councils are being efficient, and I'm suggesting that they're not being efficient. Oh, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting... I, 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 listen, I'm not saying either way. I'm saying that I'm just aware that there are lots and lots of cuts going on on all various levels. Whether they could do more or not, I'm, I'm yeah. not saying. But I'm suggesting... That, what I'm suggesting, in is that I believe they could do much more starting with themselves, and unfortunately, because the councils are so arrogant and so bloated that they let people like the gentleman you've just mentioned they they would prefer to see him suffer um which i do agree with you is is, is very unfair because they won't make the more the more uh severe cuts that are required and furthermore you know we're in a recession so surely it is reasonable to to appreciate that in a recession everyone has to accept a little bit less david i would love to get you on with a local councillor one day could we arrange that please bring him on David, thank you very much. We'll expect a phone call later on. It's David Vance, political commentator and former Buckinghamshire resident. And the other voice you heard there was Matthew Pennycook from the Resolution Foundation. Well, 08459 455 555. Let's get the travel news now. Sophie Tyler. Beds, hearts and bucks travel. BBC Three Counties Radio. The A505 in Letchworth has reports at the moment that it's queuing following a broken down vehicle just near the A6141, causing delays on the entry slip road off the A1M at Junction 9. Now southbound on the M1, one lane is closed and there's heavy traffic following a broken down vehicle as well between 15 at Northampton and 14 at Milton Keynes. And anti-clockwise on the M25 also still slow between 27 at the M11 and 25 at the A10 for Enfield and queuing also between 20 at Kings Langley and 16 at the M40. Everything else not 
not looking too bad at the moment, but we do still have disruption on a First Capital Connect between Peterborough and King's Cross and Wellingham City in Moorgate due to the overrunning engineering works at Oakley Park. Reduced service also running because of this on East Coast services as well. So do check before you travel. Sophie Tyler, BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you, Sophie. Morning, 8.16. It's Monday the 25th of March. I'm Ian Lee and these are your headlines this morning on BBC Three Counties Radio. Changes to council tax benefit mean a Milton Keynes man and his family could be out on the street. Councillors insist new homes for Luton will help people wait, uh, wanting shared ownership properties. And in sport, Watford striker Matej Vidra has won the Championship Player of the Year award. The weather today for beds, hearts and bucks. Bitterly cold wind, perhaps an odd snow flurry, yet a dry day. Maximum temperature is five degrees. Coming up, planners will make a final decision tonight on whether to approve a new £50 million leisure complex on the Bedford Riverside. Lots of you have called in. If you want to let me know what you think on that, 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. Nick Coffer on BBC Three Counties Radio. Every weekday between 12 and 3, I'm here with a little bit of celebrity. I've always loved being a comedian because it's my job, so I'm going to keep doing that. I was voted Japan's number one male vocalist of the year, and I beat out Frank Sinatra. How's that? <laughs> Expert advice. It does sound like it's a mechanical pain brought on by altered mechanics in your upper limb. Your capital's protected because I'm guessing what you don't want to do is take any risks with the capital itself. And loads of really great music. Nick Coffer, weekdays from 12 on BBC Three Counties Radio. Jonathan Vernon Smith, you've dashed into this studio looking very casual. Do you um, do you pump off? Do you do you work out? Do I pump off? Yes. Do you go to the gym and pull off a few lengths? Because what? What? <laughs> you're, you're wearing a figure hugging kind of top today. It's, I, it's, it's, I guess you could, would that be called a skinny vest? I don't know. <laughs> it's not but a I can skinny see vest. <laughs> you've either got hankies shoved up your arms, or well, you've got muscles. Look at that. Look, yeah, look there, yeah. there it is. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're quite you're quite buff. Do you do you like to do you work <laughs> out? Well. I, I, are you buff? I've, I've not. I've not been for a few weeks. Do you go? Yeah, sometimes. Really? Yeah. Well, look at your faces. We could, we could be. Like um, could we be gym buddies? Let's go be gym buddies. I think we might get chucked out. Whoa. If we went to the gym together, can we, you imagine? There'd be none of that. We just. I just want to come and pump off with you. We'd have, <laughs> we'd have. We can do a few lengths. It'll be great. <laughs> a few lengths. No, I don't. I need. I need to I get. Don't have a swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, seriously, I need to get fit, and I, I'm surprised because you normally wear quite baggy clothes. <laughs> <laughs> Look at you! You're a lean, mean, fighting, stroke-loving machine. Whichever, whichever you fancy, you could probably do both at a moment's notice. <laughs> Very well. You look like um, a young, slightly. You like um, Daniel Craig's younger, slightly weirder-looking brother. <laughs> what? What's going on? I I'm feel like I uh, am. You. I'm am, I, am I awake? <laughs> Or is this just one of those dreams no. about how this two-way suddenly goes horribly wrong? No, I'm paying you compliments. The oh, things thanks. that I'm saying are, are, are coming out good, and you're hearing them the, bad. They're a little creepy. What? To be honest, in the nicest possible way, you're putting the willies up me. And I'm not sure I like it. <laughs> On the big phone in this morning from nine, I'm asking, is the... Pro- are you all right? <laughs> I noticed earlier that man uh, called for your execution. <laughs> Steve, Steve wants me to be hung. It's hanged, but it's yes. It's hanged. Yes, yes. I was going to say that. If you're <laughs> going to call for someone's execution, at least get it right. You want Ian Lee hanged. OK? On the... Su- <laughs> when? Will you shut up? There we go. Coming up on the big phone in this morning, we are continuing with our discussion about immigration. Let's face it, who isn't talking about immigration at the oh, moment? Everyone's yes, at it, aren't yes, they? yes, yes. I'm asking today, is the problem of immigration being blown out of proportion? The Bishop of Dudley, David Walker, has launched an attack on the way politicians are exaggerating the negative impact of immigration. He told The Observer that concerns are wholly disproportionate to the real threat. Well, certainly from Steve earlier, we heard yes. uh, an awful lot of hostility towards immigration. But he wants, he wants me hanged because I've got some polls to do my loft conversion. But they're all jumping on the bandwagon, aren't they? Today, the Conservative Prime Minister, David Cameron is to outline tough new measures that cover housing, benefits and the NHS for immigrants coming to the UK. But the Bishop of Dudley, David Walker, says it's all being based on emotion, not evidence. 
Well, from nine this morning, I want to have the conversation. Is the problem of immigration being blown out of proportion? Do you think the way that politicians now all seem to be saying, oh, yes, we've got a terrible problem with immigration now. Are they talking your language? Or are they actually just stoking up a whole load of fear that's totally and utterly unjustified? I really want your views on this. Phone me from nine on 08459 455 555. Is the problem of immigration being blown out of proportion? Listen, I'm going to bring my gym kit in tomorrow. And let's, oh, let's, no, please don't. Let's just go and have a steam. My gym, you can go and do it, do it naked. G- Ooh. Across beds, hearts and bucks, this is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio. Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five is the telephone number. If uh, I, I, I look forward to and dread Jonathan Vernon Smith coming in in equal measures, I, it, it always excites me, but uh, but terrifies me because I know that when I do get the sack from here, and I will do one day, it'll be because of that moment at, at nineteen minutes past eight. It, it'll be that moment that is the one that gets me the sack. So. Yeah. Now, planners will make a final decision tonight on whether to approve a new £50 million leisure complex in Bedford. A cinema, hotel, high-class restaurants and retail space will be provided on the site of the old town hall. But many people living in Bedford fear the impact the Riverside North development will have on parking, local shops and the local economy. Well, earlier on, I spoke to John Lloyd. He's one of the residents who I think is slightly concerned with the development. Let me read you out the comments that the public made at the September consultation about the appearance of these buildings. Right? I'll just go through them. Well, these brief are on if the you public would. record. Ugly. Too blocky. Terrible. Too close to the river. Square boxes. Overbearing. Unimaginative. Industrial style. It's a carbuncle. Eyesore. Disappointing design. Cheese grater. Rag bag of buildings. Cheese grater. Huh? Poor design. Too big for Bedford. All right, we get, we get, John, we get, we get, we, we get the idea. Too John, massive. John. This improvement. Boring design. John, we no get the idea. A massive hotel. John, John, John. Bad design. John. Doesn't blend with John. other buildings. John. Disappointed. John. Monstrosity. John. Didn't keep it. We get the idea. Little architectural John. respect and looks Is very John. bleak. Is that really what we want? With us now is uh, Colin McQuesten, who is the director at Copland Estates, the developers of the £50 million Riverside North project, and also David Dixon, the president-elect of the Star Rowing Club. Morning, gentlemen. Good morning. morning. Colin, uh, if approved tonight, what will the development bring to the area? The, 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 The scheme will bring enormous benefits to Bedford Town Centre. I think I've touched on this in the past. Um, it'll bring... Up to half a million people into the town centre. It will create 250-plus jobs, um, and it will really add to the growth and reverse the decline of Bedford Town Centre. It that's... will kill off part of Bedford, though, won't it? The, the, the other side of the town that's already got a cinema and, and some shops in. Well, I think sometimes competition can be good, and I think the... For a the, cinema? Well, the other scheme that we talked about, I don't think gives Bedford Town Centre the cinema offer that many other towns around the UK um, do offer. And I, what I mean is by going into the town centre, having a meal, watching a movie and going home. And I don't think um, that's necessarily been offered to the people of Bedford by the existing cinema offer. David, last time we spoke to you, you were concerned about parking and the Star Rowing Club being unable to extend if needed. How do you feel now? Well, we've had um, good discussions with the council since that uh, interview. Um, we believe that we need access to get our trailers to the club. We need to alleviate some parking issues, and we want to discuss scope for expansion. And uh, our meetings with the council have shown that uh, both they and the developer will act in good faith, and uh, we're content to continue along that path. With so, them. David, are, are things being sorted out for you? You sound much happier than you did when we spoke a few weeks ago. Well, you, you feel happy if you have a face-to-face meeting with someone. Uh, and we've had uh, several meetings now. Uh, and I believe, yes, there will be uh, good progress for the club and, and for its members. So what things have you been guaranteed? I'm um, not prepared to go into any details, but um, our discussions have centred around uh, getting access to the front of our club for our long boat trailers. Um, we want to continue discussing uh, the alleviation of some parking issues that may or may not arise, and we want to continue discussions with um, the council about uh, what scope there is for expansion of our premises. Uh, There's a long way to go, but uh, 
we believe that uh, all parties are going to act in good faith and we'll continue along that line. Well, listen, that's fantastic if, if uh, you're being spoken to by the various parties and, and they are making some assurances. One of the other concerns I seem to remember, David, was you were worried about the view, that the hotel would ruin the view. Are you still concerned about that? Well, the hotel um, has been pushed back a bit and uh, uh, we, um, we, we have less concerns about that now. Well, you, the progress has been made, David. This is a complete yeah. turnaround. I'm, I'm very pleased to hear it. But, Colin, we, we have heard, we've, we've had so many calls this morning, we're going to speak to some in the last half hour of the show, who are worried um, about the changes this is going to make. What could you say to them, Colin, to, to make them feel a little bit better? I, I think the biggest danger to Bedford is do nothing. And I think that, that can't be considered. Um... And I think as there are discussions with um, David at the Star Rowing Club is that we're perfectly prepared to sit down and discuss and make people understand sometimes the constraints that we're working to. And generally, across the board, when we do sit down with people, people do understand and generally become more supportive of the scheme. A lot of the debate is around architecture, and I can assure anybody who's listening to to this program this morning that uh, these buildings will be of high design i mean we are looking at well that's that sounds a personal taste isn't it i mean we yes, spoke to, to, to john earlier on who, who who used the word cheese grater to describe some of these buildings and one of one of the recurring themes i've noticed in this this whole debate that we've had mm. is that so many people say we're bedford we're not milton Keynes. now I'm, I'm not knocking milton Keynes. this is just what people are saying they're worried i guess that it's that it, it, it could the buildings could be out of uh, uh, line with with the design of Bedford? Uh, I've been talking to people in Bedford for years and everybody seems to have a dislike for Milton Keynes, but I suspect many people in Bedford are going there to do their shopping and their and their leisure spend, and I think that needs to be addressed. We're not trying to replicate Milton Keynes. We are trying to put forward a deliverable and sympathetic scheme into uh, Bedford Town Centre that reverses the decline and, and will bring people back into Bedford. Colin, I appreciate your time. Colin McQuestion, a director at Copland Estates, the developers of the £50 million Riverside North project, and David Dixon from the Star Rowing Club. Well, if you remember when we spoke to David a month or so ago, he was furious. He was very angry, very upset. Well, it would seem that uh, progress has been made that he's been speaking, I would imagine, to Colin, and uh, I think he wanted to speak to the mayor as well, I seem to remember, and that actually they've been given some assurances. Well, isn't that good? You don't hear that happening very often with these big developments taking place. If you live in Bedford... Listen, I'm not knocking Milton Keynes at all. This is just... I've noticed that this point has been raised by so many people from Bedford saying, well, we're not Milton Keynes. Tell what we'll do one day. We'll do a special on um, town rivalries. Towns that look down on each other. We'll have some of that, I think, because I think that's, that's an interesting uh, thing to look across the three counties. But it definitely happens in Bedford. We're not Milton Keynes. No, 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 we're, we're Bedford. Very, sno- very snooty about it. Well, if you live in Bedford or if you visit Bedford, what do you think? Oh, wait, 459 four, double, five, five, double, five. Is this a good idea, this development, or do you think it will ruin it? Make it more like Milton Keynes. <gasps> Here's the travel news now, Sophie Tyler. Hearts and Bucks Travel. BBC Three Counties Radio. We still have one lane closed southbound on the M1 and heavy traffic following a broken down vehicle between 15 at Northampton and 14 at Milton Keynes. Southbound again looking slow between 12 at Flittig and 11 at Dunstable. And also fairly start stop around the Newport Pagnell services actually. While anti-clockwise on the M25 still heavy between 27 at the M11 and 25 at the A10 for Enfield. And queuing as well between 20 at Kings Langley and 16 at the M40. Now on the A505 through Latchworth we do have reports that it's queuing following a broken down vehicle just around the a6141. Everything else not too bad actually. A few usual hold ups, but nothing that's going to keep you out there for too long. We do have disruption, however, on First Capital Connect, still between Peterborough and King's Cross and Welling Garden City and Moorgate. Still to the overrunning engineering works at Oakley Park and a reduced service also running between King's Cross and the North as well, following an earlier incident. Sophie Tyler, BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you, Sophie. It's nearly 8.30. Time for the news and sport now with Serena Farrow. Getting beds, hearts and bugs talking. This is BBC See Three Counties Radio. 
Good morning. Changes to council tax benefit mean a Milton Keynes man and his family will be out on the street. Planners, meanwhile, are meeting tonight to determine whether or not to go ahead with a new leisure complex in the centre of Bedford. A councillor insists new homes for Luton will help people wanting shared ownership properties. And David Cameron will announce plans later to restrict access to housing benefits and the NHS for immigrants coming to the UK. Stay listening to hear more on the JVS show as they'll be discussing is the problem of immigration being blown out of proportion. That's all the news for now. Let's move on to the morning sport. Beds, Hearts and Bucks Sports. BBC Three Counties Radio. Cricket first, then in England to have a massive fight to avoid a series defeat. It's after being outplayed on the fourth day of the final test against New Zealand. The home side declared on 240 for six, leaving England to chase a world record target of 481 in order to win. Football and Stevenage lost 3-1 against Tranmere yesterday. The manager's side remained 15th in League One. Elsewhere, the Watford striker Matej Vidra has won the Championship Player of the Year award. The Hornets' leading goal scorer, those on international duty with the Czech Republic, so his manager had to pick up the award for him last night. The Luton Town manager says they still have a slim chance of making the conference playoffs. That's despite not winning at the weekend. The Hatters had a goalless draw at home to Tamworth, but John still is optimistic. I wouldn't say that it's it's the end. It's just become a touch more difficult. Um, but not the end, no, because football's a funny game. Who knows? You know, out of that nine, we might win eight, and that might just scare one or two. Turning to rugby now and Saracens director Mark McCall says two of his props should be chosen for this summer's British Lions tour to Australia. Mac of Unipola and Matt Stevens helped Saris to a 27-12 win. They now move five points clear at the top of the Premiership. McCall's impressed with both but Unipola came in for special praise. I thought he was outstanding. His first half performance was right up there with them that I've seen from what he said, the way he carried the ball the breaks that he made but equally he did very well in the, in the tight and it'll be interesting because if they bring five points props or six props. A prop with a bit of X factor might be worth his weight in gold over in Australia but equally Matt Stevens, who's not playing international rugby but is available for the Lions, played pretty well. And it's tut tut for Sebastian Vettel in Formula 1. The team principal of Milton Keynes based Red Bulls admitted they'll have cleared the air talks with him. It comes after the Formula 1 world champion defied his order not to overtake teammate Mark Webber. The Australian had been leading the Malaysian Grand Prix after the final pit stops but then Vettel went to the front in order to claim victory. Hertfordshire's Lewis Hamilton by the way came third. BBC Three Counties Radio, more from me at nine. Across beds, hearts and bucks, this is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio. Morning. Here every morning between six and nine, every weekday morning anyway, forget the weekends. That's a far more professional team involved then. Uh, Coming up before nine o'clock, there could be travel chaos in Luton. There might not be, but uh, it's proposed that 300 parents are going to drive their children to a school at uh, a protest at plans to uh, cut their free buses. We'll let you know more about that. Justin Dealey's out and about, so we'll, we'll, we'll keep an eye on that and keep an eye on the travel. But back to this development in Bedford. £50 million development, a lot of controversy about it. Some people are furious. We heard there from our last guest, he was furious, the gentleman from the Star Rowing Club. But he's actually... A few things have been promised, a few guarantees and assurances, and he, he might be OK. Well, what do you think? Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five. Lance is in Bedford. Morning, Lance. Good morning. Are, are you a, are you a fan of this development? Very much against it. Oh, why is that? Well, the uh, because it's just such a horrendous. Uh, it looks so horrendous. The uh, Chamber of Commerce imply that if this is turned down, then nothing will happen. Well, that is completely wrong. The, uh, the if this is if this design is turned down, and the um, Chamber of Commerce said that design is a matter of uh, of taste. In fact, I think good design is essential if you want to attract people to uh, a development. And in fact, it is the only thing they'll come to see. Well, what, what is this? it? Is a matter of taste, isn't it? Uh, not at all. No, you, you, there are some things which are generally agreed look bad, and and. Uh, and uh, Others, Are you've they? only got to look at Norman Foster and see uh, the stuff he produces to see that design matters. But the the thing is that this this uh, English heritage, and this is in the uh, planner's report to the planning committee, says that uh, these uh, the, the hotel, he said, will harm the conservation area. And uh, they, uh, they say that... Uh, 
the um, images submitted by the applicant in support of the application do not demonstrate sufficiently how the necessary quality of finish will be achieved. Many objectors consider that the illustrative details give the building a dark and somber character. It is therefore recommended that if members, and that's members of the planning committee, are minded to accept the overall scale and massing of the building, the details of the materials must be required by condition to be submitted for approval and that only the highest quality of finish should yes. be accepted. Basically, what that means is, yeah. if they build this building, they're going to have to, they're going to have to camouflage it so people can't see it. I, you know, why not build something in the first place that people want to look at? No, it, just, you... it just beggars belief. It says that this is a leisure centre, but it's not. It's a massive block of flats. Well, it's, it's a, a complex, isn't it? It's, it's, it's a complex with, with restaurants and a hotel and a cinema, isn't it? Well, yeah, so the cinema is so bad that in the, the uh, report from the uh, uh, planners, it says it, the front, it needs redesigning. OK, uh, Lance, thank you very much indeed. Patrick's in Bedford. Patrick, what's your take on this? Oh, good morning. Yeah. Well, I'm, um, I'm very concerned about this development uh, in terms of the design. But absolutely, we need to regenerate Bedford Town Centre. I've been calling for this for years. So that's very important. But, but it's got to be good. I mean, I think uh, Rod Calvert from the Chamber, who definitely cares about Bedford, I know him quite well. I think he's wrong to say that um, design and appearance is purely a personal matter and that doesn't matter compared to the economic issues because that's not what the planning policies for Bedford say. Could I, can I just very quickly quote? Well, no, don't because I'm, I'm, I'm getting tired of all these, these quotes. What Bedford. do you mean you're, be, you're getting tired? This is very important. This is no. about the future of, of uh, yes, an Patrick. important site in the middle of Bedford that's going to be exactly. lasting and for I... 50 to 100 years Patrick. And, and you may be tired of it no, but people in Bedford Patrick, are not. Patrick, that's, that's not what I said. What I said was I'm tired of, of people reading out quotes when I want to hear personal experiences and personal stories. So tell me why you're so against it. Because this site is very, very important on, on our beautiful riverside. Most towns would love to have an opportunity like this, having a river going through the town centre. And what we need is a superior development. That is what the planning what policy for the town calls for. It calls for a superior development. What would you do differently? I would, I would have a, an architectural competition so that we can have a much better design. I agree that we need a mixed-use d- development there, but it's got to be good, because if it isn't good, we're going to have a poor level of uh, design that's going to last for 50 to 100 years, and I think that's going to be a great disappointment. Planning policy calls for high standards, and this proposal, frankly, is not, and the planners acknowledge that in their report. They say it's really not up to standard, but we've got to go ahead because there's no alternative. I don't agree that there's no alternative, and we shouldn't give up on Bedford. Patrick, thank you very much indeed. 08459 four double five five double five. I do listen if you're going if you're going to phone the show or if you're going to uh, listen to the show. But, but please listen. I know people are very passionate about this, and I'm not for one instant dismissing this story. I gave this I, I gave it the thumbs up that we should talk about it today. So I'm not dismissing it in the slightest. One thing I do find though <clears throat> is uh, that causes people to turn off the radio is when large swathes of text are read out. And quotes, it, um, it's, it's very boring, and I, I, I let Lance get away with it, and I, I, I should have maybe butted in a little bit earlier on. Uh, I think one of the great things, we, we can all go and look up bits of text on the internet and, and read out, you know, council proposals and design proposals and stuff like that. One of the good things about doing a show like this and having you phone in is I get to hear your stories and your opinions and your takes on things. I don't want you to phone up and read out sentences. It's very, very tedious. It doesn't, it doesn't get us anywhere. D- tell me your story and your opinion. Well, I want to hear those. And I, I would imagine that the listener wants to hear most of those. So please don't f- think for a second I'm dismissing this story. Not in the slightest. Not in the slightest. 08459 455 555 is the telephone number. Another. It's been, it's been a very angry show this morning, I think we can say, quite safely. The, the, a, a lot of people have been, um, have been quite upset. <laughs> Another story that people have been upset with is... Uh, Butley Road in Luton. People have been fighting to keep the land behind their homes as an open space for over two years now. And after many years of fighting, it's expected the council will approve the plan to start the process to build homes tonight. Earlier on, we spoke to Stephanie, who's a resident, who's very upset. We also spoke to Labour councillor Tom Shaw. Karen is in Luton. Morning, Karen. Morning. You, you live, do you live on Butley Road? I do, yes. 
Uh, what, what do you take on? The, what's your take on this? Are you frustrated? Frustrated is not the word. The council are saying, you know, they haven't got money. Um, they've got brownfield sites. But they're, they're spending money on, on what? Love Luton? How many thousands and thousands of pounds have they, they wasted on that? They've wasted money on going for city status. Who wanted that? Nobody. The guy did busway. Were we consulted on that? No. So that's millions of pounds they've wasted. They're saying they're listening to, to the Luton people, but they're not. You've had people from Cardinal Newman saying the council aren't listening. They haven't got the money to do this, that and the other. That the council do not listen to the basic human human in in Luton. They're, oh, I, I'm furious. They've taken this land. They're giving it away. They will have formally give it away to the developers tonight. Um, and, and there's brownfield sites. You cannot build on green space without using all of the brownfield sites. Sure said the councillor Shaw said last time he was on the radio that he was going to, they were going to compulsory purchase brownfield um, land for phase three. Sorry, that should have been phase two. Compulsory purchase before giving away green space that people need to be alive, to live, to walk, to exercise, to have fun. They're taking it away and they're not listening to, to the Luton residents. Karen, I, I can hear you're very passionate about this. It, when we spoke to Councillor Shaw earlier on, he, he said that um, uh, by giving this land away, the council were, were actually receiving benefits that they wouldn't have got if they'd sold the land. But they've got land that they could give away, brownfield land. You've got the, the drill hall. How many years has that been empty? How many years has that been going on? And And that's not, you know... Vauxhalls are going to be free soon at some point, but how long has t- uh, the drill hall been empty? Wesley's, they knew that Wesley's was going to be um, empty of old people before they put in p- planning for um, a green greenfield space. Why can't they use that? Karen, listen, thank you very much. Uh, 08459 455 555 if you want to talk about that. Um, back to Bedford. It's a, ve- it's a very angry show this morning. I'm surprised I'm remaining so calm. I'm calmer than I normally am. You're, I think you're sucking all of the anger out of me. Barbara is in Bedford. Bedford uh, Barbara, Bedford. Barbara, are you a, a fan of these developments? Does, does Bedford need to be developed? No, I don't think it does. No, I'm sorry. I've got my radio on in the kitchen. Is it spoiling things or can you hear me? I, mean, I, can, I can hear you. I think we can fine. get away with it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I'm Bedford born and bred and I'm 70 now. Now, when I was young, where they're going to do this development was a cattle market. It was Horn Lane Brewery, Charlie Wells Brewery and the cattle market, of which we could park there when the cattle market wasn't on. And there were outdoor car parks in Bedford. Now, my concern is they've built on all the outdoor car parks in Bedford. They're hoping to get people in in the evening to use these facilities, restaurants. My concern is, where do you park? You can't come in on a bus or dressed up to go out for a meal. Um, Where do you put your cars? You can't come in on the bus, not even to do your shopping in the day. If you come into town, go to the market, buy your veg. There's no way you can get them back on a bus. They're little street shuttles, hardly room for you to sit down, nowhere to put shopping. So I go to St Neots now, easy parking. Um, I just don't know why Bedford keeps wanting to fill in all their empty spaces when they want people in the town to do their shopping. Is there enough... So if there were more car parks, would that encourage people in? Is is there enough in the town? Not outdoor car parks. And not everybody wants to go in these upstairs car parks. Sorry? The multi-storey car parks. Why? Um, well, if you're on your own, it isn't very pleasant. Also, it does get very busy. People go into work and park in their cars there. Late at night... Well, I just think the outdoor car parks... There isn't... You don't really see outdoor car parks anymore, Barry. There isn't really the room for them. The the, the thing with the multi-story is you can get so many many more cars in such a small space. I quite agree. But you'd get more people in the town if you've got a few more outdoor car parks. They built on Castle Lane. That isn't a great success. I know Mr Branson used to cut to work from there and he saw these empty spaces. And you 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 think outside car parks... Are the way forward to save Bedford. I, I do think... That Barbara, listen, thank you very much indeed. 08459 455 555. Controversial. Barbara thinks the answer is simply outdoor car parks. I'm trying to think when the... You don't really see outdoor car parks anymore. You see a few small ones 
scattered about, but uh, generally it, it is all the multi-story. I, uh, is anybody else not, not a fan of the multi-story? Anybody else dislike them so much that they refuse to go into a town because of them? I'm, I'm surprised, but thank you, Barbara. 8.45, travel news now, Sophie Tyler. Beds, hearts and bucks travel. BBC Three Counties Radio. Still looking fairly busy at the moment on the motorways. The M1 in particular is busy southbound, particularly between the Newport Pagnell Services and Junction 14 at Milton Keynes, where it's fairly start-stop at the moment. Also looking at delays between 12 at Flittick and 11 at Dunstable. Now, anti-clockwise on the M25, it's still busy between 27 at the M11 and 25 at the A10 for Enfield, and slow also between 20 at Kings Langley all the way through to 16 at the M40. Barnet Bypass is busy southbound around Mill Hill Circus. Also looking busy on the A10 heading south just around the Vets roundabout heading through Buntingford everything else not too bad but on the trains we are looking at disruption on First Capital Connect between Peterborough and King's Cross and Welling Garden City and Moorgate due to overrunning engineering works also affecting things on East Coast services and London Midland have delays of 20 minutes in Northampton and Rugby and Northampton and London Euston following an earlier broken down train Sophie Tyler BBC Three Counties Radio Thank you Sophie Right 8.46 Monday the 25th of March I'm Ian Lee These are your headlines on BBC Three Counties Radio. Changes to council tax benefit mean a Milton Keynes man and his family may find themselves on the street. A councillor insists new homes for Luton will help people wanting both rented and shared ownership properties. In sport, the Milton Keynes-based Red Bull boss will hold talks with his two drivers after Sebastian Vettel disobeyed orders in the Malaysian Grand Prix. uh, Coming up, traffic could grind to a standstill in parts of Luton today with up to 300 cars joining a protest over the planned loss of free bus travel to school for 600 pupils. Before nine, well, we're going to try and catch up with Justin Daly. No word of a lie, he's stuck in traffic. I know. Right, let's get the weather. Here's Sarah Thornton. Beds, hearts and bucks weather. BBC Three Counties Radio. Oh, the irony. Good morning to you. It's a very cold start out there. Minus two at High Wycombe at the moment. Around uh, freezing at St Albans, minus one at Milton Keynes. That's the spread of temperatures. It is a cold start and we won't get much warmer than that through the day today. A lot of cloud around, but generally dry. The odd snow flurry coming through. Nothing that will settle, though. We might see a little bit of breaking towards Milton Keynes and uh, Bedford later this afternoon. Uh, Generally, though, if you're in Buckinghamshire, it's safe, fairly cloudy, I think, through the day today. And a high on the thermometer of 3 or 4 Celsius, but it will be tempered significantly by the biting northeasterly wind. That will certainly make it feel much colder than 3 or 4 Celsius, somewhere around the freezing mark. Uh, Through the night tonight, again, we'll see a widespread frost. But like this morning, you won't be scraping the cars because the air's fairly dry. It will, though, be another very cold start tomorrow morning. The next few days, generally dry, a lot of cloud around, some breaks in the clouds, some brighter spells coming through at times, not really helping the temperatures, that biting northeast wind really continues right the way through until Thursday when it starts to slowly ease and then the question mark is really all about Friday, Good Friday of course start of the Easter weekend and there is the risk of some snow as um, some milder but wetter weather moves up from the southwest off, off the Atlantic and as it comes in and meets the colder air over the UK, well that could spell snow, it's all to play for in the forecast we'll keep posted right here on BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you very much Sarah On Tuesday night, Three County Sport is at Kenilworth Road. And it's a goal for Luton! With a night of conference football, as Luton entertains struggling Ebbs Fleet. Gray getting away from his marker inside the box, Andre Gray! Taps it in for Luton! And he's there again, Andre Gray! You can hear the whole match live on FM, AM, online and DAB digital radio. Three County Sport, Tuesday night from 7 on BBC Three Counties Radio. Oh, I was dancing a little bit too vigorously to that. I've uh, done myself a mischief. Something's got trapped where it shouldn't be. Now, there will be an extra 300 cars on the roads in Luton this morning as parents protest over the planned loss of free bus travel to a school for 600 pupils. (coughs) Excuse me. The parents are planning to drive from Sacred Heart Roman Catholic Church in Stopsley to Cardinal Newman Roman Catholic School to drop off and collect their children today instead of sending them on the bus. 
Well, earlier on, our reporter Justin Dealey was at Sacred Heart Roman Catholic Church in Stopsy. He spoke to Antoinette Cotula, the Cardinal Newman Preserve Our School Transport Committee. Hazel, we voted you in eight years ago on this. You supported us on it. You seem to have gone back on your ward. Really, really think hard. This is a big, strong community, and we we, we can turn it around. We can we, we can we can ignore Hazel and not have her voted back in again. So please listen to us on it. Yes or no? Will you win this fight? Yes, we will. A hundred and fifty percent. Well, Hazel Simmons uh, joins me now. Hazel, uh, you just heard what was being said there by uh, one of the protesters. What's your take on that? Obviously, the democratic process will take its toll. At the end of the day, the council has has to make significant cuts that have been imposed upon them by the government, uh, 49 million over the next three years. And we agreed at the start of this process we would look at all areas of service that, uh, that the council does. And uh, we spend about a million pounds on home to school transport, not just denominational, but across uh, all the school transports. And we're having to look at reducing some of the costs of that, well, as we was... are in every other area. We wouldn't normally be doing this, and this is, this is not something that, that would be something that is on our agenda or wherever it was on our agenda. But we are a very different place now to where we were eight years ago. Hazel, Antoinette uh, says that uh, earlier on, a few years ago, you made a promise to the Catholic community to keep uh, providing the free transport. As leader of Luton Borough Council, uh, um, have you broken your promise? Well, we sent a letter to the, to the head which said that during the time we were in administration at that time, eight years ago, um, and we've been in power twice, uh, once more since then, that we would not uh, cut the transport. So you could but be breaking that promise. we did say that we would not impose that restriction on any uh, other administration that came into power, because we can't. We, we could lose power at any time, but, and uh, so we you, can't oppose that So you could potentially be breaking that promise? If that's how they perceive it, then that's what they must see. Well, it, but if the reality is, uh, we wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for the government cuts being imposed. Oh, no, of course, of course. And I know that this is all being handed down, but, but you, 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 did you say in, in that letter that you wouldn't be um, charging for... You wouldn't be getting rid of the free transport? For, for the, the administ- each administration that we ha- have, we said we would not get rid of the, uh, the cuts, but we said we would not impose that position on a future administration, and this is one of the future administrations. Oh, so by... Sorry, so, so just to is, clarify... If we weren't having these cuts, no? Ian, we wouldn't oh, be no. opposing. And I think you made the point, but just to clarify, by future administration, you mean after you've been elected in again? So yes. each, each four years? Uh, okay, each so. time we get elected in, okay. we can make that, that promise, because uh, we can't impose a promise like okay. that on a future administration. You've seen yourself that yes. eight years ago, the finances of the council were in a very different state to where the finances of the council are today. Well, Hazel, let's just cross over to our, our traffic correspondent Justin Dealey who's out and about with some of the protesters. Justin, what's, what's going on there? Well Ian, I spoke to you this morning at about 10 to 8 um, yeah. the parents were, were going to be leaving the Sacred Heart Roman Catholic Church there just after 8 o'clock. That's exactly what happened. I followed the parents they're going to be travelling to the Cardinal Newman School. Ian, that's a 12 minute journey Unfortunately, I am nowhere near the school, probably a good seven or eight minutes away still. A few moments ago, I managed to flag down Antoinette again, and we had a very brief chat, and this is what happened. Well, school starts at 8.45. Clearly not going to make it. Traffic has been absolutely horrendous here, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely shocking. We set off at about five past eight from Stock and St- or from uh, Sacred Heart Church, and we're now on Stock and Stone Road, and it's 8.45, and we've still got about a mile and a half to go. So we'll, it'll be way after nine o'clock before we get there. I mean, we certainly didn't see up to 300 cars, probably about, what, 30 to 40, but even 30 to 40 has made a big difference as far a, as you're a concerned. A huge difference. And then uh, I've just had a report that the whole A6 is completely blocked up on all sides because cars are coming from all over they're coming down from Farley Hill, they're coming from all over basically, so uh, yeah, I, I, I think we've proved our point that if the buses go basically, people get in the cars, drive and the congestion is going to be horrendous And you don't feel guilty for what you've done at all? Uh, because if we if we don't do this this is what's going to happen every day from September and we don't want the people to go through this, I don't want to go through this every morning, most parents don't want to go through this, so please, the council needs to listen this is the reality. So the words there again of Antoinette so uh, clearly they feel their protest has worked as I mentioned there Ian there certainly wasn't 300 cars but even those 30 to 40
40 cars, uh, as far as the, the, the parents are concerned this morning, have made a difference. They have proved their point to Hazel Simmons and Lutonborough Council. If this funding is cut, traffic will be like this day in and day out. Justin, thank you very much. Hazel, what, what do you make of that? That could, that well, could be the thing every we'll day. Take that into, as, as you know, we're in a consultation mm. period. We've met with the head three times. Um, we're looking at to the head of Cardinal Newman, I should say, uh, and to, trying to negotiate some way forward on this, and we'll continue to do that. And this will obviously be taken into account as part of that consultation. We don't take the decision on this until April the 29th, so it will it will go in as, with all the other information that we have at that time. Okay, uh, if you would mind, Trish from Luton has, has just called in. Uh, uh, Trish, you've got a question for Hazel. Yeah. Yes, I do. I'd like to understand, because of the cost that will uh, occur to families wanting to send their children to Cardinal Newman, if families can no longer afford because of the transport, they opt for a local school, there'll be a significant oversubscription to the schools, local schools. What do the council propose to do about that? We are looking at that at the same time as we're doing the rest of the consultation uh, around this, because that has been raised with us, obviously, by uh, other parents. So that is something that's being considered, along with all the other points that have been raised. Hey, uh, d- Trish, sorry, do you not... Um, d- d- does it make sense what Hazel was saying, that these um, cuts that ha- are being made, they've been handed down from the government, and it's, the council have to decide how to make those cuts? Do, 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 yeah, do you... I think they have to understand the bigger impact, because the, the Carmel Newman is the only senior Catholic school in Luton, and it services five primary schools, so, and they're all from different locations. So the cost of a parent to send a, a child to Cardinal Newman in a few years' time will be extremely expensive. So it, it brings into question the whole Catholic denomination of the, ch- uh, of the school. Will it continue? So I think there's a bigger impact here that needs to be considered. Do you feel any sympathy for the council, Trish, with the decisions they have to make? I think it's very tough. I absolutely do. But I think that when they're making the decisions, they can't take it in isolation. They can't look at a, a balance sheet and say, we can save X number of thousand pounds here. They have to look at the impact on the community. Can I just say, and we, don't, we don't take it in, in isolation like that. We always look at all the other issues. Impact assessments are done on every decision we make, uh, and we take in every uh, risk and uh, analysis on that whenever we take any decision like this. OK, so if the Catholic denomination of the school falls below 50% and the Catholic Church decide that they don't want to continue with the school, what do the council propose doing then? I would hope so there won't be a school there, and every school place will be needed in 2014. I would hope. That, well, there will be a school there, but they, well, um, we have to get to that at the time. At the moment, but it's that's not a really serious bad. consideration, isn't it? I mean, has that been put before to you before? We, we, we th- th- all we've had so far is parents raising that issue, and it is being considered by and looking being looked at as part of the risks of all that we're doing and, and considering at the moment. The reality is. If we don't take this kind of cut out of this denomination, which is a discretionary service, don't forget, a but discretionary it's been an honorary service. one that's been happening for the last 40 it, years. It, I, just let me, let me finish. If we don't take the cut out of this, then we have to look at where we take something like 500,000 out of other services in children's services many of which are already are statutory services. Trish, so there is an um, argument, there is an argument that, that, that free school transport is, is perhaps a luxury. Um, well, if they can afford to spend £800 million on a, a, a transport link from Luton to Dunstable, then I have to argue that the £500,000 a year to send children to a school isn't necessarily a luxury. Trish, we'll, we'll end it there. You've got the last word on that. Uh, and thank you to Hazel Simmons, uh, Labour leader of Luton Borough Council, for coming on and discussing that. We'll keep you informed uh, uh, how the travel chaos ensues. It's supposed to be happening later on today as well when uh, the, the young people are picked up from school. So no doubt Roberto will be uh, keeping his BDI over that. Well, what a lot of uh, fury this morning. I've, and su- I'm surprisingly calm after all of that. I think I've had all my anger sucked out of me. So thank you very much for that. I, I may have deposited my anger all over the three counties. Let's get the travel news now. Here's Sophie Tyler. Hearts and Bucks Travel. BBC Three Counties Radio. 
Southbound on the M1, we have reports the two lanes are blocked and there's queuing traffic following an accident around Junction 12 at Flittick. Also still fairly heavy anti-clockwise on the N25, between 27 at the M11 and 25 at the A10 for Enfield. Also still queuing between 20 at Kings Langley and 16 at the M40. There's also looking fairly busy in places like uh, the A10 heading south through Buntingford. Fairly slow there just around the Vets roundabout and also in Chesant as well. The A10 also looking busy, particularly between College Road and Winston Churchill Way. Now on the trains, we are still looking at disruption on First Capital Connect services between Peterborough and King's Cross and Welling Garden City and Moorgate. Reduced service also running because of this on East Coast services and delays of 20 minutes on London Midlands between Northampton and Rugby and Northampton and London Euston following an earlier broken down train. Sophie Tyler, BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you, Sophie. Nice to have you back. There we go. I'm glad she... And she, oh, she's obviously so glad to be back. <laughs> Listen, thank you to everyone who called and took part. Back tomorrow at six. JVS is up next. Until then, ta-ta. Getting beds, hearts and bugs talking. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you, Ian. Good morning. Welcome to the JVS Show. I'm Jonathan Vernon-Smith. It's Monday... Start of a new week and on this morning's big phone-in, I'm asking, is the problem of immigration being blown out of proportion? The Bishop of